Chapter 40 Taln 8 Taln and Lon crouched in a side chamber, the room lit only by a window on the far wall. Footsteps, yells, and the sounds of battle echoed through the palace's stone hallways. Lon's breathing was quick. What? What's happening? the monk demanded. Someone has taken the oath gates, Taln said quietly from his position at the doorway. The outside hallway was empty. Taln turned from the hallway door and slunk across the room to the window, peeking outside. They sent soldiers through to secure the palace. He could see a large assemblage of soldiers gathering outside the window, right at the top of the ramp leading down into the city proper. The men appeared to be lounging idly, as if waiting for orders, but their postures were slightly forced. They were members of the invading army sent to make certain no one escaped the palace and warned the people below. Whoever the invaders were, they worked efficiently. The ramp had been secured within minutes, and the attack was well placed. The palace was probably understaffed with soldiers, most having gone with their various lords to join King Elicar in his war-making. Well, that way is cut off. There were at least fifty soldiers atop the ramp, far more than he would like to try fighting on his own without a shard blade. He probably could have reached the ramp ahead of them, but he'd chosen to hide instead, fearing that Lon wouldn't be able to keep up. Apparently, that had been a poor decision. Lon listened at the doorway a little longer, obviously trying to determine the validity of Tuln's words. Eventually, the monk joined Tuln at the window. Who could it be? he asked nervously. Tuln shook his head. They're Kanoran, he said. Either Vaden or Prolon. Perhaps Yakoved is attacked, or maybe some remnants from the conquered Prolon nations are trying to get revenge on your king. Their identity doesn't matter to us. Our job is to get past those soldiers and escape before the city is captured. Lon frowned. We can't go. We have to do something. Like what? Tuln said, leaving the window. The western ramp had been taken, but perhaps he could beat the invaders to the eastern ramp. I don't know, Lon admitted. Don't you care if the city falls? This city fell centuries ago. Tuln said frankly, glancing out the doorway and making certain the hallway was still clear. He paused, looking back and noting Lon's concern. Look, if you want to help your countrymen, you have to escape the palace first. Get to the lower city with me and you can raise the alarm if you wish. It matters not to me. Lon nodded, joining Tuln as he crept from the room and began moving through the palace. He tried to stay to the periphery of the labyrinthine structure, away from the oath gates. The invaders would have to bring in many soldiers quickly, secure the palace, then try and take the city gates by subterfuge. While Aram's people would be accustomed to seeing large groups of soldiers moving through the streets, King Elokar's war preparations had been steady during the last few weeks. It was a daring attack, but a clever one. The first capital was isolated in its cliffside location. An occupying force could hold the city with ease, assuming it gained control of both city walls and oath gates. But how? Tom thought. How did they get through the oath gate? Elokar would have been a fool to leave his side open to invasion. It didn't matter. True, the bickerings of men were harmful. Divisiveness would lead to destruction when the Hothen came. But for the moment it didn't matter to Tom who held Ral Aram. One unbelieving kingdom or another, it was the same. A sudden gasp from Lon drew his attention. Tuln paused, one hand against a stone wall as he listened for the sounds of battle. The monk's face had grown pale and he was looking down a side passage toward something Tuln couldn't see. What? Tuln hissed, joining the monk. He needn't have asked. Bodies lay scattered through the hallway, blood pooling on the white marble. They wore the simple clothing of servants, their bodies hacked and mangled, obviously cut down as they tried to run. Lon turned, retching. Tuln stood silently, observing the carnage. Why? Lon finally whispered. They need to secure the palace, Tuln said quietly. Killing the occupants is faster and safer than trying to capture them. This way no one escapes to raise warning. 
Lon turned away from the slaughter, slumping with his back against a wall, shuddering sickly. Tom stared on. The dead stared back. Oh, almighty, he thought, bowing his head. Sometimes I wonder if they're worth protecting. A scream sounded from behind. Lon glanced up. The scream was close, just down the hallway. Tom didn't turn toward the sound. He looked through the hallway of corpses, past the death, toward a window at the far end. Through it, he could just barely make out the slope of the eastern ramp. It was empty. I need to go. This fight is not mine. I need to escape so that I can— The scream sounded again. Lon scrambled to his feet, apparently trying to judge the sound's location. His hands shook as he scrambled over and picked up a discarded length of wood one of the dead peasants had tried to use as a weapon. Lon paused, looking down at his weapon. The scream sounded again, and he looked up. His posture was nervous, his hands quivering. Then he struck off down the hallway toward the sound. Lon would fight. Even though the monk had never held a weapon, he would fight and die to protect the one who screamed in fear. Lon might be an idler, as he always claimed, but he was a good man. Some of them were definitely worth saving. Tom looked down at the bodies as the screams called to him, feeling an anger begin to burn in his chest. Three thousand years had men been on Roshar, three thousand years of being killed by the Chothan, buffeted by high storms and surviving upon the harsh rocks of an inhospitable world. Three thousand years, and they still had not learned. They still had to kill. Quietly cursing himself for a fool, Tom turned his back on both corpses and windows. He stalked down the hallway, passing Lon, following the sounds, and slammed open a door at the end. A group of the fake Aleth soldiers stood with corpses at their feet. A small cluster of terrified servants cringed near the far wall, women clutching children, men huddled and frightened. Those with the will to fight back already lay in their own blood. The door shook as it slammed against the far wall, and the soldiers looked up. Most held spears, though a sword-wielding nobleman directed their work. The officer waved toward Tolm, barking a command in a language Tolm almost understood. A spearman approached Tolm with a grim expression. The soldier's eyes bespoke a guilty resolve. He had convinced himself that, as a simple foot soldier, he was not responsible for the immoral decisions of his betters. You should know better, Tolm whispered angrily. The spearman thrust with his weapon, and Tolm was finally free. No angry monks stopped him this time, no noblemen turned their backs, and no Lady Yasna appeared to stay his hand. It had been centuries since he had last been able to fight back. Tom ducked to the side, snatching the spear's haft and yanking it forward. The soldier yelped, falling off balance, and Tom grabbed him by the arm, twisting with a firm yank. The arm popped in its joint, and the man screamed in pain as Tom jerked him around, grabbed him by the back of the neck, and slammed his forehead against the stone doorway. The soldier slumped to the ground, and Tom kicked the spear up into his hand. He spun it and fell into a fighting stance. The other soldiers stared down at their unconscious comrade. The frightened servants fell silent, looking up with hopeful faces. "'Kill him!' the officer yelled, his foreign words becoming distinct as Tom's mind decrypted the changes in the Vaden language since his departure. Tom did not wait for the soldiers to obey. He leapt forward, spinning his spear in a staff form. The four spearmen fell into a line, like battlefield warriors, holding their spears as if to thrust— Tom knocked their weapons aside, slamming the butt of his spear into a head as he spun past. He ducked beneath a spear swipe, turning to ram his weapon through a second man's side, just below the breastplate. The soldier stumbled to his knees, his death throes twisting the still impaling spear in Tom's fingers. Tom dropped the weapon, ducked to the side, and kicked another fallen spear up into his hands. Then he raised it to deflect a third soldier's thrust. Tom jumped backwards, spinning his weapon around so the tip faced behind him, then rammed it through the surprised nobleman's neck. Tom turned, sidestepping a spear thrust, then spun his weapon around and stabbed his attacker in the thigh. The man dropped to one knee, and Tom took him down with a second thrust to the face. 
The final spearman tried a wild thrust, but Talon wrapped the haft of his own weapon against the man's spear three times in blinding succession, stepping forward with each hit, then dropped his spear as he got too close for effectiveness and punched his opponent square in the face. The spearman fell unconscious. Talon spun one final time, cloak billowing, as he kicked a third spear into his hand. He raised it carefully, eyeing the fallen men for further danger. The impaled spearman finally jerked to a painful stop, and none of the others moved. The room was still. By the winds, a voice finally whispered. Lon stood at the doorway, eyes wide with shock. Tom lowered his spear, the metal tip clicking against the stone floor. Then he dropped the weapon, waving toward the frightened servants. See to them, he ordered Lon as he moved to check on the servants who had been struck down before he arrived. There were five. A couple of the dead lay clutching makeshift weapons, lengths of wood or kitchen knives. Only one had a pulse, an aging man in the uniform of a citizen courier. Tom rolled the injured man onto his side, pressing his hand against the still bleeding spear wound. He reflexively reached out to the Nael bond within him, preparing to draw upon the life energy of the thousands who were linked to his soul tone. And found nothing. He cursed quietly. There would be no healings this return until he discovered what had happened to his powers. He would have to do things the old-fashioned way. He reached over, sliding a dagger from a dead soldier's belt, then cut away the wounded man's shirt. The spear wound was relatively shallow. Father, a younger woman said, rushing to the man's side. Lon gently pulled her away as Tone cleaned the wound with his water flask, then bound it with a strip of cloth from the man's own cloak. He nodded to Lon, motioning for him to let the girl attend the fallen man. Tone stood, assessing the situation. There were nine servants remaining, minus the wounded man, but four were women and three were children. The two men were an unimpressive pair, obviously brothers. They were spindly, nervous, and dressed in the simple garb of kitchen assistants. You two, Tom said, kicking a pair of spears into his hands. Take these. The two kitchen men caught the spears in uncertain hands. I, uh, my lord, one began. I know, Tom interrupted. You don't know how to use them. Try and look like you do. He tossed a third spear to Lon. Same for you. He nodded to the four women. Two of you fashion a letter from that nobleman's cloak and the two remaining spears so we can pull the wounded man behind us. One of you watch after the children. And you. The final woman was a stout middle-aged scullery maid with a wrinkled, unfrightened expression. Tom tossed her the nobleman's sword. She caught it with surprise. They won't expect you to be armed, Tom said. Find a way to exploit their ignorance. Let's move. As the women crafted their litter, Tom gathered daggers from the fallen soldiers. He kept two and gave the other three to the unarmed women. Then he told the servants to remain still for a moment as he ducked back into the hallway and checked the eastern ramp. It was now guarded by another squadron of soldiers. Tom gritted his teeth, then made his way back to the room. The women were still working on the litter when Tom re-entered. As Tom tried to decide what to do, Lon approached him. It appears I was wrong about you again, the monk said. Where did you learn to— Lon trailed off as Tom regarded him with a suffering expression. Oh, right, Lon mumbled. Three thousand-year-old pseudo-divinity. Well, got any holy powers that will get us out of the palace? Tom snorted, tucking one of his daggers into the knife fold on the inside of his cloak. You're the one who wanted to stay and help. Lon looked helplessly at the spear in his hand, then down at the dead servants and soldiers. He gritted his teeth. Right. Where next, then? Tom shook his head. Your first instinct was right. We need to leave. I can't fight an entire army. Do you think they intend to kill everyone in the palace? Tom asked. Probably. That would be the easiest way to ensure that no one gets out to warn the city guard. They'll likely take a few hostages from among the upper nobility to use as leverage against Elokar, but it's doubtful that even those will survive the invasion. The upper nobility, Lon said. You mean like Lady Yasna? Tom paused. Yes, exactly like Lady Yasna. 
Why did the thought bother him? He owed the woman nothing. Or did he? She had saved his life, perhaps twice. Though she thought him a madman, she had seen to his care, even his comfort, during his stay in Ral Aram. He had seen the way that hostage women, even nobility, were often treated by their captors. The ramps were blocked, the palace sealed. In better circumstances, perhaps he could have taken the oath gates and stopped the flow of soldiers, but he didn't have the manpower to attempt such a dangerous move. There were, however, other ways out of the building, ways known only to those who had been present when the foundations were lain. It was on the way. If he took them to the cellars, he would pass through the Aleth royal quarters— it would probably be only a short stop to check and see if Lady Yasna were still alive, assuming he knew specifically which rooms belonged to her. Tom turned, regarding the steady-backed maid, who had taken command of the small group of maids and was directing the construction of the litter. The woman worked efficiently. Her presence was obviously a comfort to the younger girls, and they had almost completed their task. Woman, Tom said. She turned. Denia, my lord. Denia, Tom said. Do you know which quarters belong to Lady Yasna, my lord? She asked. The lady was to be married today. Do you want her quarters or her husband's quarters? Married, Tom thought with a shock. Her quarters, he finally decided. It was as good a choice as any. I can show you then, my lord, the chambermaid said. Once we reach the proper section... Tom nodded to himself, stepping out the eastern door and listening in the hallway beyond. He heard faint sounds of battle coming from the rightmost corridor. This way, he said, waving his nervous group forward. That way? Lon asked. But that's the direction of the fighting. Where there is fighting, there is resistance, Tom said. And that is where we want to be. Come. Chapter 41 Yasna 9 The Vorin wedding ceremony was an archaic tradition, a remnant of epochs when the religion had held far more sway than it did in modern Roshar. Voranism hadn't had any real power since the turn of the epoch, when the Oathshard kings had proclaimed the cycle of returns broken. The religion's eventual decision to stop warning about storm shades and returns, accepting as canonical the reports that the heralds themselves had declared the Chothan defeated, had only weakened its stance further. In modern Roshar, it was fashionable to profess Voran allegiance, but few noblemen gave much thoughts to the Almighty's supposed whims beyond paying their tributes and attending the occasional reading from the arguments. The monasteries were no longer the political power they once had been. Still, tradition was the foremost law of Aleph noble culture, and even a professed heretic such as Yasna could not escape a Vorin wedding. Of course, as much as she was displeased by her forced submission to the Almighty's approval of her union, the emotion could not compete with her distaste of the man she was to marry. Meridas stood with the air of smug satisfaction of a man who thought himself responsible for far more than he could legitimately take credit. He wore a fashionable pair of long leather boots, a pair of loose trousers bulging out over the top, and a militarily cut overshirt with wide cuffs. His cloak was blue, of course, to signify his union with the Kolin house, and it matched Yasna's tala, which Meridas himself had purchased and sent to her. It was a fabulously extravagant gown, dressed with frills and colored with the deepest of blue dyes. The left sleeve, traditionally long, was tiered with overlapping swaths of light blue silk down to the cuff, which ended just short of her ankles. The location for the ceremony was the Eleventh Hall. The wedding was attended mostly by women, for their men were at war beside their king. 
her brother himself, was noticeably absent. Elokar's official reason was the pressing need to respond to Jezenrosh's attempt at assassination. The truth, Yasna suspected, was more private. She had seen Elokar several times before he left the palace to join his troops, and each time he had been unable to meet her eyes. It did not surprise her that he had chosen not to attend the wedding. The ceremony began, and Yasna noted with distaste that Lardan, the obsequious first monk of Peacehome, had been chosen to officiate. Lardan stood at the front of the room beside Meridas, beaming at the importance of his position and probably thinking of the generous tribute her brother would have given Peace Home in exchange for performing the ceremony. The first monk began with an overdone speech, then waved for a hundred candle-bearing monks to enter the hall, lighting the way for Yasna to approach. She did so, trying to keep her head high and her face expressionless, despite her sickened stomach. Shinri had disappeared the night of the dueling competition. Undoubtedly, Elokar had assumed the girl knew too much and had ordered her silenced. The thought made Yasna despair. Shinri had done nothing wrong other than to associate with Yasna. Her death, like those of Nelshendon and Kemnar, could be attributed directly to Yasna's foolish devotion to her brother. Yasna had spent the last few weeks locked within her rooms, only allowed freedom when escorted by a ten-set soldiers sworn to Meridas. Every letter she scribed was confiscated by the guards, presumably to be translated by monks and likely destroyed. Those responses which did come had been opened and perused and were always of little use. She had hoped that some of her more subtle pleas for aid might go unnoticed by her captors, but she suspected that Meridas himself was the one looking through her letters. For an unmarried man such as himself to excel so wonderfully at politics, he had likely been forced to learn some traditionally feminine skills. When she reached the front of the room, Yasna knelt on the cushion bowing her head before the standing form of the man who would soon be her husband. She knelt with resignation, not without hope. Though her skin squirmed at the thought of Meridas touching her, she had never expected anything but a marriage of necessity. For now, there was little she could do against the men who had betrayed her. However, the wife of a Parshan was a powerful woman and men were creatures of short memory, quick to laxness, and presumed victory. She had seen that her brother kept his throne during the chaotic years following their father's death. She could see it lost to him during the uncertain years of conquest. The ceremony proceeded, Yasna kneeling in the uncomfortable position as Lardan droned on, quoting from the arguments and the way of kings. He drew upon the formal Vorin ceremonial texts as well, quoting passages that implied nobility was granted and suffered by the monks, passages that would never have been tolerated outside a wedding speech. Soon the time came for the final piece of the ceremony. Lardan proffered his blessing, and Meridas extended his hand to accept Yasna as his own. Yasna looked up at Meridas, regarding the oily merchant in his finery, his hand proffered. When she took that hand, she would legally be his, bound by promise to protect his interests and his power. The room was silent as she stared at the open palm. Lardan coughed uncomfortably, and women in the crowd shot each other nervous glances. Can I do it? Yasna wondered. Political necessity or not? Can I marry the man who killed Nell Shendon? The door burst open, a sudden breeze causing candles to flicker. Heads turned to regard a bloodied soldier. My lord, the man cried, 
stumbling forward, monks and noblewomen shuffling away like scattering rodents. The palace is under assault. What foolishness is this? Meridas demanded, lowering his hand. The soldier held his side, blood dripping between fingers. The oath gates, my lord, they have been breached. Meridas paused, then white smoke formed around his hand. Take my wife to my chambers, he commanded four men of his honor guard as his blade appeared in his hand. The rest of you, come with me. The soldiers pulled her to her feet, several ladies in waiting scrambling forward to help Yasna gather up her extensive blue sea silk train. The soldiers nervously led her from the room, the monks and other nobility staying behind, muttering amongst themselves in uncertain voices. The oath gates? Breached? It was unlikely. The gates had been designed so that no such thing could happen. No king, even one of the infamously noble kings of the original Oath Pact, would allow an uncontrollable portal into the center of his capital city. Both sides of a gate had to be opened by awakeners before passage was possible. Unlikely, true, but not impossible. An awakener spy could have been sent a young one, new to his power, one who had not lost his sensitivity to the outside world, but instead retained his ambition and interest in politics. If such an awakener could have found his way to the Oathgate chamber, opening their side. But who would invade? Dalinar? Had he joined with Jezenrosh? Somehow, Yasna couldn't see her stately uncle working in such a devious manner. Thalena, then? King Amelin was said to be very lax with his awakeners, allowing them free reign of the city. Ral Aram was even more depleted of troops and shard bearers than it had been during the extended Prala campaign. Elokar wanted to make quick work of Jezenrosh, attacking with flair, before his allies remembered how wearied they were of war. What if the first capital had proven too tempting a gem for an outside invader? Such were her thoughts as the guards rushed her toward the Aleth section of the palace. She was so wrapped up in her machinations that she didn't notice the attack until the first guard fell dead. Yasna stumbled back in shock as the man died, her ladies screaming in horror. Meridas's soldiers leapt into action defending themselves against a group of armed attackers who burst from a doorway at the side. The attackers had superior numbers, however, and they quickly overwhelmed the three men. In a matter of seconds, all three of Meridas's soldiers had fallen. Yasna looked for escape, but knew that her dress would keep her from moving with any speed. She would easily... Yasna froze realizing with shock that she recognized one of the attackers. Kemnar? she asked incredulously. Kemnar bowed slightly, motioning for his men to secure the hallway. My lady, he said. Yasna exhaled in relief, holding up her dress and stepping over a guard's body. Her lady attendants cowered behind her, confused. She had thought Kemnar dead for certain, she should have known better. It took you long enough, she said. Kemnar smiled toothily. He bore a fresh scar on his face, one that came dangerously close to his right eye. Sorry about that, he said. Elokar knew I escaped. Had half the soldiers in the city looking for me. Fortunately, I know a number of people who've made quite a profession out of not being found. Kemnar! one of the men shouted. She recognized several of them from her personal guard. The others were new to her. There is fighting coming from this direction. Gather up the fallen swords, Kemnar ordered, stepping forward and picking up Yasna's train. We'll probably be tight for funds, and we should be able to pawn them. Watch that corridor. I don't want any surprises. He looked at her. Sorry about this, my lady he said, taking his sword 
and beginning to slice off the back of her dress. Then, Yasna said, the palace is really under attack? Yes, Kemnar replied in a low voice. We were planning to wait for this evening to rescue you, but when the ruckus started, we decided to move. He pulled the bulk of the train free and tossed it aside. Then he waved to his men. Let's go, he said. Our primary concern is Lady Colin. Let that fool Meridas worry about the invaders. The ten men nodded, escorting Yasna and the three frightened ladies-in-waiting away from the sounds of fighting toward the eastern section of the palace. As they walked, Yasna caught sight of a doorway into one of the servants' quarters. She froze, gasping slightly despite herself, as she saw the bodies littered within. Kemnor paused beside her, face grim. Then he nodded for them to continue. Kemnar, Yasna said. My lady, we have no choice, he said. What would you have us do? Fight to defend the palace and risk losing you to the invaders? Do you have any idea how valuable a captive the king's own sister would make? Yasna nodded, steeling herself against the carnage. She had seen death before. She had spent years with Elokar on the battlefields of Prala, but common people were somehow different than soldiers. At least the massacre tells us it's not Dalinar who is invading, she said, moving forward again. Kemnar nodded. They must be trying to secure the palace, taking control of the oath gates quickly before news can reach Elokar. Some remnants of the Pralan rebels, perhaps? This Ranta group that Lord Dalinar thinks is behind the death of the traitor? If they got an army to the traitor without us seeing, they might have been able to get one into the city. Perhaps, Yasna said. Their trail ended at a large, unoccupied set of chambers in the eastern wing. It had a wide terrace with large open doors that overlooked the city below. Kemnar peered through the balcony doors, then cursed quietly. What? Yasna whispered, joining him and peeking out into the sunlight. The ramp, Kemnar said, pointing. A squad of at least five ten-set soldiers lounged near the top of the stone ramp leading down into the city proper. But they were Aleth Blue, Yasna said eagerly. We can bring them back to the palace and... Those are no soldiers of ours, my lady, Kemnar informed her. There are hardly that many left in the entire city, and they would never gather here. They're too busy guarding the walls. The invaders want to box us in. Kemnar ducked back. He didn't speak, but Yasna could see the troubled look in his eyes. If the eastern ramp, the one farthest from the Oathgate chamber, was guarded, we should check the western ramp, just in case, Kemnar decided. Other than the ramps, the only way out is through the oath gates themselves. And I doubt, Kemnar, the lookout shouted. We've been spotted. Kemnar cursed, grabbing his sword and waving his men to fan out. At the end of their hallway, a large squad of soldiers strode their direction. Kemnar was right. Despite their blue uniforms, they were collectively too tall and broad to be Aleths. Vadens, Yasna thought. It would explain the slaughter. Vadenar was far more militaristic than Alethkar, its soldiers known for their harshness. Kemnar slammed the hallway door shut, but there was no bar, only a small latch. He jumped back as the door smashed open, and the battle began. The fight went poorly from the very beginning. Yasna backed up to stay out of the way, but there was nowhere to run. They dared not escape through the terrace, for just beyond, mercifully out of earshot, waited the ramp-guarding soldiers. Kemnar's men were outnumbered nearly two to one, and they had to worry about protecting Yasna and keeping any of the enemy from escaping through the terrace and bringing enemies up from behind. Yasna watched her defenders die. They fell with heroism, but they died all the same. Soon, 
Only Kemnar and two other men remained, backed up in a tight circle around Yasna and the three ladies. Her protector's breathing was heavy, limbs wet with blood. Nine enemy remained, seven spearmen and two sword-bearing noblemen. There was a lull as the two sides regarded one another, their companions dying on the floor around them. Kemnar glanced up suddenly, his eyes flickering toward something behind the invaders. One of the soldiers noticed the motion, turning. He mumbled something, alerting his companions. A man stood at the end of the hallway, alone, dark, almost like a shadow. He was unarmed. Taln, the madman. Yasna groaned quietly. She had forgotten that this was the day she had arranged for his departure through the oath gates. She had unwittingly brought him to his death. Taln stepped forward. No, Taln, Yasna yelled. Run! He did run, toward the soldiers. He stooped down, cloak fluttering as he dashed forward with a speed that belied his size. The nobleman at the back raised his sword to cut the madman down. Steel glittered in Taln's fingers as twin daggers appeared from beneath his cloak. Surprisingly, he dodged the nobleman's attack, then rammed his daggers into the man's upper arms. The nobleman screamed in pain. Taln snatched the falling sword, then rammed its hilt into the nobleman's face, the force of the blow tossing the man backward. The nobleman fell against the back ranks of his own men, and the battle pulsed to life again, but with a change. The new participant drastically altered the flow of the conflict. Taln was a boulder rolled through a patch of insects. He was a spinning god of death, quick, precise, Almost inhuman, he sliced the end off a spear as it thrust for him, then easily beheaded its bearer. As Kemnar stumbled near Yasna, falling beneath the assault of several soldiers, Taln hurled his sword. The fine steel short sword whipped through the fray, slamming into the head of one of Kemnar's assailants, causing the man to stumble long enough for Kemnar to regain his footing. Taln kicked up the two-foot end of the spear he had sheared from its haft, catching the pseudo-weapon without even glancing toward it, then plunged it dagger-like into the chest of an attacking spearman. Even as the attacker fell, Taln bent to the side, dodging another spear. He grabbed the offending spear, yanking it in its bearer's hands, so the haft came up and took its owner in the chin. A kick sent the man reeling back into the second nobleman, stunning both long enough for Tom to duck and rip the broken spearhead out of the dying soldier, only to plunge it into the chest of the off-balanced spearman. The soldier fell, dropping his spear as if into Tom's waiting hand, and this came up to block the nobleman's attack. The nobleman's sword bit deeply into the wood, and Taln spun the spear, sliding both weapons from their owner's hands and dropping them to the ground. The nobleman glanced toward his sword as Taln reached to the side where the second spearman was trying to pull the broken spearhead from his chest. Taln wrenched the spearhead free, letting the man collapse with a sigh, then slammed it into the nobleman's back as the man ducked to retrieve his sword. Kemnar and his two companions held their ground, finishing off the last two soldiers. As the final Vaden fell, Kemnar jerked to a surprised halt, regarding the swath of dead men at Taln's feet. The madman was completely unwounded. Kemnar whispered the tenth name of the Almighty, lowering his sword. The other guards did likewise. Then, from behind Taln, a group of people poured into the hallway. Kemnar fell into a fighting stance before realizing that these were not more soldiers, far from it. Though most bore weapons of some sort, they held them uncertainly. There had to have been at least fifty of them, palace servants and other citizens, a group of children, and several litters carrying the wounded. Taln stepped forward, 
as Kemnar checked his fallen comrades for life. The madman stood before Yasna for a moment, quiet, but breathing deeply from the battle. Lady Colin, he finally said. Madman, she replied, tipping her head. It seems your family isn't the only one who dreams of holding all ten oath gates for itself. Yasna flushed with anger despite herself. Do not compare me with these, she said, nodding to the slaughterers. Tarn eyed them, then nodded. You are right. I apologize. You fight well, she noted. Unexpectedly well. Perhaps I shouldn't have kept you from taking back your sword at the feast. Tom smiled slightly. If you hadn't stopped me, I wouldn't be here now, and you would be dead at these soldiers' hands. The Almighty's ways. Then he turned, eyes losing their smile as he regarded the dead. Kemnar had found two men alive and was helping one to his feet while his companions bound the other's wounds. He would have to be carried. Yasna's stomach turned at the sight of the massive group of peasants. How were they to escape with such a great number? In fact, how would anyone escape? Taln had rescued them, but if the oath gates had fallen as Kemnar claimed, an army was likely on its way through at the moment. Though Taln fought amazingly well, he still fought as a man, with steel and wood. She had seen no signs of supposed divinity, and one man, no matter how good, would not be able to stand against such odds. Tarn obviously saw the look in her eyes. He moved over, peeking carefully out at the ramp beyond. We can't escape, she whispered. Tarn shook his head. There is another way. Isel, Janiz, help Lady Yasna's men with their wounded. The rest of you, let's go. We don't have much time. Two of the palace servants hopped forward, moving to assist Kemnor. The rest of the citizens stood nervously, gripping their weapons. Kemnor glanced at Yasna questioningly. She held up a hand, bidding him not to join the fleeing peasants. The madman spoke with presumed authority, obviously giving no thought to the fact that Yasna or even Kemnor, grossly outranked him. In another man, the assumptions would have been insultingly arrogant. To Tom, they simply seemed natural. He had led men before. Whoever he really was, that much was obvious. Where do you seek to take us? Yasna demanded, as Tom picked through the fallen weapons, distributing them as he saw fit. The madman looked up. The palace cellars he informed. There's a passage there into the caverns beneath the mountain. Yasna raised an eyebrow skeptically. Tarn sighed, then approached her, holding the fallen nobleman's sword. Look, he said quietly, you think I'm insane, but I obviously learned how to fight somewhere. Is it inconceivable that I might know something about this building that you do not? Your family has, after all, lived here for less than a generation. Yasna narrowed her eyes, but said nothing. Tarn obviously took the silence as a scent. He handed her the sheathed sword. Here, he said, hold this. I may need it later. With that, he waved his ragtag group forward, taking the point position, followed closely by several younger men and his peace home monk friend. Kemnar stepped over next to her, watching the strange group leave the room. The cellars will leave us trapped, he noted. We're trapped anyway, Yasna decided. Besides, it might earn us a little bit of time. You said the invaders are trying to secure the palace. They'll check the cellars last, since they have no exits. No exits. Her own words fell harshly on her ears. Kemnar seemed to accept them, however, and he waved his three able-bodied companions to close around Yasna to escort her after Tom's troop. The going was brutally nerve-wracking, but
but mercifully uneventful. The palace felt oddly silent now, an atmosphere enhanced when they passed corpses in hallways or rooms. Some were palace guards, but more often they were regular citizens, cut down as they ran or hid, slaughtered regardless of gender or age. The hallways, once familiar to her, now felt alien. Yasna shivered. After a short time of travel, Talm held up a hand, stopping the procession. Yasna pushed her way forward, past wounded servants and young men with untested weapons. Talm had given some of them swords, she noted, despite their citizen status. What? she asked, as he stood quietly. Listening he said. There is battle up ahead. I had assumed the palace secured, but someone obviously fights on. Yasna frowned. She heard nothing. The direction Tom had indicated led to the oath gates. Their group had been forced to skirt uncomfortably close to the center of the palace in order to reach the cellar stairwells. Tom waved her to remain where she was then crept forward to a hallway intersection. He returned a few moments later. We'll have to sneak past the next intersection, he explained to Yasna and the few men who stood near the front. Shouldn't we go and help whoever's fighting? The monk asked. Tom shook his head. We shouldn't have delayed this long as it is. It isn't your life and mine we risk now, Lan but the lives of all those we've saved. We cannot afford further recklessness. Talon organized the peasants into a line, then approached the intersection and waved them forward in small groups. Not waiting for her turn, Yasna joined him at the intersection, the weight of the sword he had given her unfamiliar in her hands. She ignored his suffering glare, turning to peer past him down the leftmost hallway of the intersection. She was mildly surprised to realize that he was right. There were sounds coming from that direction. The hallway broadened near its end into a small entryway, and she could make out forms moving in this section, though she could see nothing distinct. Occasionally, a yell of pain would carry through the stone passages. There were, however, no sounds of metal on metal, just the screams. More executions she said grimly. No, Tom corrected as the servants continued to pass. It's something else. Those screams are all Vaden. You claim to be able to tell accents from screams? Yasna scoffed. Tom nodded distractedly, looking down the hallway with confused eyes. Then his eyes opened wide. He turned with a sudden motion. Lan! The cellar stairwells are two intersections up on the right. Lead the people down and wait for me there. Lon opened his mouth to object, but Talon ignored him, taking off down the side hallway in a fast creep. Yasna cursed quietly, watching him go. What was so important that he would abandon the people so quickly after giving his speech on not being reckless? He's insane, she reminded herself. He may seem stable, but he's not. However, insane or not, they needed him. If the secret passage in the cellars did exist, Talm would have to live long enough to show it to them. Kemnar, go with the people and protect them, she ordered. I'm going to bring the idiot back. I'll send my men, Kemnar replied. But I'm not leaving you. Fine, Yasna said rising and moving down the hallway with as much stealth as she could in the frilled blue dress. She could see Talm up ahead, standing in a pillar alcove just before the hallway widened. She needn't have worried about sneaking. The soldiers ahead weren't watching their backs, instead focused on something Yasna couldn't see. She joined Talm in his alcove, receiving another suffering glare. What is it? she hissed, ignoring him. Tal nodded past the pillar as something walked into view ahead of them, a man, Meridas. My blade, Tal whispered. 
The noblemen stood indifferently before a group of nervous invaders, their spears held at the ready. The remains of those foolish enough to attack lay on the ground already, dismembered in various ways. Meridas held Talm's shard blade casually by his side, point down in his odd, relaxed, dueling stance. Meridas dashed forward without warning. The seven spearmen didn't stand a chance, not against a shard blade. Meridas took them down in three swings. He's good, Tal noted with a frown. I didn't expect that. Meridas, Yasna called, showing herself as the nobleman wiped his sword. Meridas raised an eyebrow as he saw her, then frowned as he saw Talm. You should escape the palace, woman, he said, turning away from her and stepping over a body. He walked away impassively. Where are you going? The oath gates, he said. I'll cut my way through and escape to warn your foolish brother. I told him not to leave the city so undermanned. The oath gates are sealed, Talm said. King Elokar ordered them closed. How will you escape through them without an awakener? Meridas paused. Just then, a door at the side of the hallway flew open, revealing two men in shard plate, probably summoned to deal with Meridas. They assessed the situation and the dead soldiers. Then one stepped forward and held out his blade in a dueling posture. Meridas smiled as if their arrival were a pleasant gift and nodded his head to the first man. Beside Yasna, Tom tensed. No, she hissed. These are shard bearers. They'll cut you down without... Talm reached up, ignoring her as he grabbed the hilt of the sword she still carried. In front of them, Meridas and the first man began their duel. Shard bearers are like other men, Talm whispered, hand on hilt. Swing something at them and they can't help reacting. Watch. With that, Talm whipped the sword out, leaving the sheath in Yasna's hand, and jumped toward the second shard bearer. The man turned in surprise, raising his weapon. Talm swung his sword, and the shard bearer parried reflexively, slicing Talm's weapon in half. The shard bearer didn't notice the dagger in Talm's other hand until it was too late. The Vaden cried out, dying with a length of steel in his eye, and Talm grabbed his shard blade as it fell then jumped directly at the back of the man dueling Meridas. Talm cut down the second shard bearer before the man even knew he was there, dropping him with a thrust directly between two sections of shard plate. Meridas scowled as his opponent died. You peasant, he hissed angrily. That was against protocol. You attacked a man already engaged in a duel. Talm snorted picking up the second shard blade. He gestured toward the open door from whence the shard bearers had come. Beyond, Yasna could make out a small pile of corpses, all of them in servants' clothing. Men who would condone that, receive no quarter from me, Tom said, stepping toward Yasna. He held out the second shard blade to Kemnar. I watched you fight to protect the lady. You are a man of skill and honor. Consider yourself promoted. Kemnar's eyes widened slightly. Even he, with his sarcasm and seeming indifference to noble politickings, would have dreamed of someday owning a shard blade. It was an honor a nobleman as low-born as he would probably never receive. He glanced at Yasna, and she nodded slightly. Kemnar took the blade with reverent hands. Behind, Meridas's expression darkened even further. Talm turned and held out the second shard blade. Now, he said, you will give me that blade you hold in exchange for this one. Meridas frowned in confusion, then glanced down and smiled, hefting his blade. I think not. This one suits me just fine. It was not a request, Talm said. That blade was taken from me by force. 
I will have it back. Meridas smiled, lowering the blade to his side in his dueling stance. You and I, then, he said. Shall we see how you do when you aren't stabbing your opponent from behind? Very well, Tom said, putting one foot back, raising his blade. Enough, Yasna snapped. You would squabble with one another while the palace is being overrun around us, our people being slaughtered? Save your bickering for another time. Meridas didn't break form. Talm, however, had the decency to glance back with a small measure of guilt. He lowered his weapon. Meridas, Yasna continued, this man claims to know a secret way out of the palace. I suggest you come with us, unless you plan to fight Vadenar's army on your own. Kemnor, gather the shard plate. Shocked from his stupor, Kemnar nodded and moved forward. Shooting a wary glance at Meridas, Talm joined Kemnor, quickly unfastening the magical straps and gathering the pieces of metal in the dead man's cloaks. You believe the madman's claim? Meridas said with a snort, strolling over to her. Do we have any other options? Yasna asked pointedly. Meridas frowned, his Talm's shard blade disappearing from his hand in a curling breath of white smoke. Taln and Kemnar rose a moment later, dual cloaks full of shard plate thrown over their shoulders, blades in hand. Let's go, Yasna said, stalking back down the way they had come. Taln and Kemnar followed quickly. Meridas trailed with less enthusiasm. A few moments later, they reached the stairwell and Yasna pulled a lantern off the wall and led the way down a twisting, cramped stairwell. The truth was, she had never actually gone down them before. There was little reason for a high-ranking noblewoman to visit the cellars. As they reached the bottom, her lantern revealed a group of nervous, spear-wielding servants. Their faces flashed with relief as they recognized her. Yasna scanned the group and was surprised to realize that the numbers had swelled. Other servants must have sought refuge in the cellars as well. There had to be close to a hundred people crowded between the wine racks and bags of grain. Entire families huddled uncertainly, watching her with hopeful eyes. All right, Yasna said, turning back to the stairwell as Talm and Kemnar reached the bottom. Let's see this passage. Madman. Talm pushed past her, dropping his pack of shard plate. Lan, please find someone to carry that, he requested. The monk's eyes widened as he saw the gold gilded metal beneath, and he glanced at Talm's blade with wonder. The crowd huddled away, whispering to one another as Talm walked toward the back of the room. Yasna followed, surprised at the size of the cellars. They extended into the distance, a connection of catacomb-like stone rooms with great unadorned pillars to hold them up. Talm wove his way certainly, moving past barrels of water, sacks piled to the ceiling, and boxes of spices. The crowd trailed behind, a ghost-like group of men and women, their eyes haunted. Many were probably familiar with the cellars, they knew, as Yasna did, that there was no exit through them. What had Yasna led them to, trusting the whims of a madman? Most of them would be dead without that madman, Yasna reminded herself. As would you. He deserves to be heard, if only for that reason. Eventually, Talm paused inside a small, unused room. He waved Yasna forward with the light. The rest of the group paused uncertainly behind, standing just outside the room. Yasna stepped inside, the tattered remnants of her dress train leaving a trail in the dust. The room was perhaps ten feet by ten feet, too small to be of much use. Dark mold covered one wall, and a couple of broken crates rested in the corner. Talm pushed aside a couple of crate pieces, then wiped the dust from the back wall. 
It was crafted of worked stone bricks, like the rest of the cellar, their color a dull gray. He pressed against one of the stones, and of course, nothing happened. Tom frowned. He pressed again, harder. Something's wrong, he mumbled. Yasna closed her eyes, exhaling softly. This should open, Tom complained quietly. Chanaral himself designed the mechanism. It was crafted by the finest of epic shapers. Time should not have weakened it. The blades still work. Why wouldn't this? They were trapped. Dead. Perhaps, perhaps they could hide long enough until night and then sneak away into the city. It was a slim hope. The invaders had to know that people would be in the cellars. Footsteps approached, and a figure pushed its way through the crowd to Yasna's side. Someone's coming down the stairs, Kemnar said urgently. We barred the door at the bottom, but... He said the words quietly, but the crowd was too close not to hear. Some of the people cried out, women clutching their husbands. Others looked down with despair. Yasna glanced back at the madman. He stood on the left side of the small room, wiping at the mold covering the far wall. Beside her, Kemnar rushed over and grabbed the cloaks full of shard plate, then disappeared back in the direction of the stairwell. Tal, she said. We have to fight. Leave it. There is no passage. The madman ignored her. There he said, almost to himself, breaking away what appeared to be a piece of aged mortar. But what is the purpose of this? Tom, Yasna snapped. Then she paused. Something glittered beside Tom's hand. She frowned, stepping closer, holding up the light. A shining black gemstone was set into the stones. Even as Yasna approached, she could hear its tone begin to hum in her mind. Obsidian, her pole stone. What? she asked. Why is that there? It's a lock, Tom said with a frown. Like the ones on the oath gates. I don't know where it could have come from. I wasn't here last return. From behind, a series of rhythmic thumps echoed through the cellars the sound of axes striking the stairwell door. Time is short, my lady, Kemnar's voice called in the distance. We'll have to cut through the wall, Tom said, turning from the obsidian and raising his shard blade. Without an awakener to stroke the gemstone, we can't open the door. This will leave an opening for our enemies to follow, but perhaps the other shard bearers and I can hold the gap long enough to... He trailed off. As Yasna closed her eyes, listening to the call of the obsidian, it was a cool, clear tone in her mind, so familiar, enticing. She took the tone of her own soul, rubbing it against that of the gemstone, calling forth its music. Even without opening her eyes, she knew the obsidian had begun to glow. A rumbling shook the room. Yasna opened her eyes, then stepped back as a portion of the wall in front of Talm fell away, throwing chips of mortar and dust into the air. It slid back into the wall, revealing a dark passage beyond. Talm stood, blade lowered, regarding her through unreadable eyes. Yasna glanced behind self-consciously. She hadn't touched the obsidian, however. To anyone else, it would have appeared that Talm had opened the door, hopefully. Get the wounded into the passage, Talm commanded, waving at the gawking servants. The rest of you, gather whatever supplies you can. We'll need lamp oil, grains, and water. Hurry! Yasna stepped aside, letting the servants begin to scramble through the opening. Kemnar returned a moment later, wearing the golden suit of shard plate. He paused, 
staring at the opening, then ran back to get Meridas and the other soldiers. The axes continued to fall in the background. Talm still watched her. Yasna glanced down, not wanting to meet his eyes. A few minutes later, supplies gathered, the last of the peasants rushed into the hidden passage. Kemnar clinked past, as did Meridas, who had obviously claimed the other suit of plate. Eventually, Talm waved her through. She strode through the doorway, followed by the madman. The passage was of worked stone, much like the cellars, yet the stones here seemed different, more aged, if that was possible. Talm pressed a stone on the wall, and the hidden door rumbled closed behind them, sealing off the cellars even as the sounds of men yelling echoed closer and closer. The servants held their lanterns nervously in the dark. Talm waved them to move forward, straight ahead, into the darkness. The stone sloped downward, and Yasna realized that she had no idea where they were going. Where does this lead? She hissed at him. Down, Talm said simply, walking forward. Yasna sighed, following him, last in line. She paused a second later, however, as she noticed a side passage. It appeared to be the only one in the corridor. She held her lantern high, revealing a door in the distance. It was beautiful. Worked of metal and gemstones, it sparkled in her lantern light. She could make out the pattern of the double eye set in its face, marked by ten massive gemstones at the pole positions. Even from the distance, she could hear them humming slightly in her mind. Come on, Tom said, appearing again at her side. What is that? she asked. Tom paused, his eyes quiet as he regarded the door. It is nothing, he finally said. Come. Hesitantly, Yasna allowed herself to be led away into the dark passageway and the bowels of the mountain. Chapter 42 Dalinar 3 The twenty dueling forms were ancient, older even than most shard blades. Formalized lore, taught to students just after they began training with the sword, explained that Canaran dueling had been developed by the heralds themselves. Nail Ilin, the finest duelist of the ten, was said to have set up the system as a way for men to prepare for the coming of the storm shades by fighting and training without fracturing the epic kingdoms through war. Dueling was the first and primary masculine noble art. All lords were expected to learn its secrets, and so Dalinar trained. Sparring was familiar, the one great constant in his life. Brothers, wives, and children might die, monasteries and their morals might have to be left behind for war, but there was always the duel. Peace or strife, ill-temper or good, Dalinar always took the opportunity to spar, even if it refused to calm him as it once had. Brother Mazenchal fought with Blade and Plate, one of three prized sets owned by Shieldholm. Mazenchal was good. He fought with a subtle variation of garnet form, third-century Denise line, if Dalinar remembered correctly. Garnet was a solid, straightforward form that focused on single-hit wins. Mazenchal was more defensive than most garnets, however, mixing a bit of obsidian in for misdirection. It made for a fine combination, one that Dalinar had always respected. The sparring did not last long. Bouts against Garnets never did. Dalinar won, scoring a second blunted strike against Mazenchal's shoulder. At the end, Mazenchal removed his helm, waving for a young monk to bring them water. That's three out of four, my lord, the monk noted as he sipped from the ladle. He was a husky man with powerful legs and a surprising quickness about him. Like most birth-given monks, he bore no scars from true battle, but that was no reason to presume him inexperienced. 
The winds favor me today, Dalinar said simply. Mazenchal shook his head. One wonders if you even benefit from sparring here any more, my lord. I can beat nine out of ten topazes. Garnet is strong against it, you know. But you— Dalinar accepted the ladle, not responding. Garnet was strong against topaz, true. The first focused on quick explosive kills, the latter on endurance and precision. Garnet was a form for duels. Topaz was a form for the warrior who expected to fight a half ten set different duels on the battlefield, bouts waged beneath a hot sun with spearmen waiting to attack the victor. If I may be so forward, my lord, the monk noted, waving the young water carrier away, you are as fine a master as this monastery has ever known. Perhaps you should consider taking students. Perhaps when better days come, Brother Mazenchal. Dalinar said. Ah, oh, the monk said, bowing his head. Forgive me, my lord. I momentarily forgot your uh, distractions. Dalinar waved dismissively, indicating that Mazenchal forget the supposed offense. The monk bowed and retreated, allowing two younger monks to remove his plate so it could be used by another. Dalinar stood in the sun, sweat from the sparring rolling down his cheek. Mazenchal's comment was the closest anyone had come to mentioning Arador's disappearance since the discovery five days before. Monks and lords alike stepped softly around Dalinar, none wishing to acknowledge his shame. Dalinar wished such a luxury upon himself. Arador's betrayal, and that's how Dalinar had to regard it as a betrayal— had undermined whatever authority Dalinar had hoped to maintain through neutrality. How did it look for a lord to make a command, only to have his own heir flagrantly disobey? Even worse than the political embarrassment, however, were the other repercussions, punishments that must fall as soon as Arador returned. Did the boy realize the position in which he had placed his own father? For Dalinar to keep his oath, an oath made before an official emissary of the king, he would have to disinherit his own son. Dalinar closed his eyes, sighing quietly to himself. And who did that leave? Renarin? Openly stripped of his blade by the king? Dalinar had no illusions about Renarin's reputation. Dalinar's tribute lords and shard-bearers would undoubtedly follow the boy out of loyalty to Dalinar's memory, but such loyalty dulled over time. It was not a good foundation for rule. Perhaps once the shame of his act was forgotten, Arador could be reinstated. It was unlikely, however, that the lords would forget recent events. In their minds, Arador would be forever the boy who had ignored his father's command. How could Arador command their oaths when he himself had so flagrantly broken his own? Not for the first time Dalinar wished for Shenares's calm, understanding counsel. The boy would have made a wonderful lord far better than his father. Shenares had been able to make peace without creating enemies— and could give commands that men followed out of desire, not just duty. Another monk was stepping forward to spar. They knew that Dalinar liked to vary his opponents. Dalinar stretched his hand to the side to begin summoning his blade, but paused. A litter was approaching the monastery. It was constructed of fine dark wood and laced with light pink sea silk, and the bearers wore Dalinar's own insignia. He made a motion to his sparring partner, and the man stepped back, nodding deferentially as Dalinar strode across the sands to meet Kanae. She rarely visited him during his sparring time. Though he had never forbidden her, Kanae somehow sensed that Dalinar saw the monastery as a place of refuge, escape. And, despite her innocence, she obviously knew that he found her one of the things from which he needed that escape. The litter-bearers stopped near the entrance to the monastery, where several of Dalinar's attendants stood, waiting for commands or messages. The bearers lowered the litter, and Kane stepped out, swathed in regal sea-silks suited to a more mature woman. 
She glanced uncomfortably around the grounds where monks had stopped their sparring to regard their future lady. My lord, Kinney said in her formal voice, we just got a messenger who says that my father is coming to Kolinar. Your father? Delinar asked with surprise. How many days away is he? Not days, my lord, Kinney said. The messenger said he'd be here within the hour. Delinar gritted his teeth so the men wouldn't hear him curse. Lord Achathan of Cardinar was a fine man and an excellent battlefield commander, but he despised being fussed over. He often complained that he'd rather eat with his men than dine at a regal feast, and absolutely loathed protracted ceremonies. He was, Dalinar reflected, much as Dalinar himself would be had he not been forced to grow up as a brother and uncle to kings. Gather my shard bearers, Dalinar commanded one of his attendants. Pull them from baths and dining if necessary. I want at least a tenth set of them there to greet Lord Echothan. He pointed at another man. Order the cooks to prepare for a feast, simple food, without much garnish. A third man. Warn Lord Valen of Echothan's arrival. He'll know what other arrangements to make. Dalinar had learned early in his career that he needed a good palace steward to care for the details of pageantry that most nobility expected of a Parsian. My lord, Kinney said under her breath, I need to talk to you where others can't hear. Fast. Dalinar paused. Kinney was getting better at femininely masking her emotions, though how she was learning such things without being someone's ward was beyond him. However, now that she had spoken, he could see the barely contained urgency in her eyes. She could have sent a messenger to bring him word of her father's impending arrival, yet she had found it necessary to come herself. Whatever she wished to tell him, it was important to her. Dalinar made a few more commands, then stepped back a few paces, waving Kinney forward so that they could speak in private. Is this about your father, Kinney? Dalinar asked quietly. No, my lord, she said, glancing nervously back at the attendants and monks. It's about your son. Arador? Dalinar asked with surprise. No, my lord. Renarin. I... I think he's going to sneak off to the war, too. What? Dalinar asked incredulously. Kinney shied back at the outburst, looking down and flushing. Dalinar controlled himself. Don't overreact, he thought. This is Renarin she is speaking of. The boy wouldn't do such a thing. His wind's cursed unassertiveness might be annoying, but it usually keeps him out of trouble. Kinney, he said calmly, what made you think such a thing? I heard him talking, my lord, she replied in a small voice with Lord Marin. They were in the Lord Renarin's room. I was passing in the hallway, so I listened to them. Lord Marin said, We have to go after him. Lord Renarin said, We can't. My father will be angry. Then Lord Marin said, We have no choice. We can't let your brother die alone. Dalinar stewed, grinding his teeth. They couldn't possibly. But they could. Marin still didn't know the ways of nobility, and Dalinar knew that he and Arador had become good friends. Renarin had always idolized his older brother. If Marin put it into his head that they should go— I'll check on it, Dalinar said stiffly. You did well by bringing this to me, Kinney. The girl looked up, smiling at the encouragement as Dalinar waved her back to her litter. He sent no messenger. As the Kolinar palace shuffled and spun with servants preparing for a distinguished visitor, Dalinar himself went to check on Renarin. The boy was not in his rooms. When Dalinar found Marin absent as well, he began to worry. He didn't admit the truth, however, until he visited the stables and found that Renarin had requisitioned two of Dalinar's swifter horses not an hour before. Apparently Renarin had told the stable hands that Dalinar wanted him to ride out and meet Lord Echothan and escort him to the palace. Dalinar forced himself to remain quiet about the disappearance. Even when Lord Echothan's party arrived with no Renarin as an escort, Dalinar hoped that perhaps the boys would see their foolishness and return on their own. If they did so, he would be spared punishing them. 
Surely Renarin would realize the stupidity of joining the war effort. He was no fighter. But Marin was. Dalinar had known so many young men like him. Most noble, but boys were the same regardless of parentage. Marin was eager to prove himself. Twice he had saved the king's life, both times by fighting when no one expected him to. He would assume himself immune to reprimand, would think that this time, like before, he would somehow find a way to do what everyone assumed he could not. Dalinar kept his anger in check even as he stepped forward to greet Kane's father. Third Lord Echathan was a man who could have been a king, both in bearing and in lineage. His city, Cardinar, had been mostly independent of Alethkar since the turn of the century. Made wealthy by grand sapphire mines and trade through its calm bays set at the very end of the Kolinar Late, the city had been close to declaring itself a separate kingdom until Nolanarin's firm defense against the invader Jarna. Dalinar still remembered a young Echothan riding with his father to join against the invasion, defending a common border despite internal disputes. When Echothan himself had inherited a short time later, Nolanarin had been quick to gain the young lord's loyalty, folding Cardinar back into Alethkar without sword or spear. Echothan bowed deeply before Dalinar. "'Greetings, my Parshan,' he said. He had changed little since those days. He had lost most of his hair, and now shaved off the rest, and time had added some creases to the face, but he was still the stark and eager warrior who had ridden at Dalinar's side during the Jarna War. Dalinar forced a smile to his face. You needn't prostrate yourself so, old friend. Come, I've ordered a feast to refresh you from your journey. Echothan stood, smiling, then turned to regard Dalinar's fourteen shard-bearers, all in plate, who stood at the head of a quarter-ten squad of soldiers, all saluting. Dalinar had avoided anything too dramatic, no thrown flower petals, no trumpeters or heralds, just the soldiers greeting one of their own. This, however, still proved too much ceremony for the aging Echothan. I see I gave you too much warning again, Echothan said with a wry grumble. I'll have to try and find slower horses for my messengers. Dalinar chuckled, despite himself, turning and letting Echothan greet Kane. Again the man bowed. Through betrothal, his own daughter's rank had been elevated beyond his own. She held herself well, all things considered. We have prepared rooms for yourself and your men, my lord, she said. Please make use of them. We shall begin the feast whenever you feel prepared. A slight discomfort flashed in Echothan's eyes. Thank you, my lady, he said. He turned, waving his group, mostly nobility from the looks of them, to follow Dalinar's attendance to their rooms. Dalinar fled to his balcony again. He stared out over the darkening late, listening to the lingering sounds of feasting below. He had retired at a distinguished time, leaving the younger men to their revelries, though he doubted many of them would enjoy themselves as they would at another lord's palace. Dalinar's thoughts on drinking and gluttony were well known. Below, a group of dark-cloaked men galloped from the stables, torches held high in the night as they rode on their lord's business. Dalinar could no longer wait for Marin and Renarin to return. Rumors were already spreading. The stable hands had spoken of the missing horses and the lordlings who had not returned in Echothan's party. By dawn, most of Kolinar would know that Dalinar's second and final son had betrayed him as well. This time, at least, Dalinar could deny the rumors. Renarin had told no one of his leaving and had given no explanation. Assuming Dalinar's men caught them before they arrived at the war, there might be something he could do for the boys. The late cliffs were strange dark mountains in the waning light. Dalinar sighed, suddenly feeling so very old. A sound came from behind. Dalinar turned to find Lord Echothan, tall and broad-chested, standing at the doorway to his balcony. 
Dalinar waved him forward. Echothan stepped up to the stone railing, resting arms on its top, a glass of wine held loosely in one hand. You look northeast, he noted, toward Crossguard. I look northeast, Dalinar agreed, and consider the idiocy of youth. Echothan smiled. We were idiots too once. I sometimes wonder if we still aren't, Dalinar said quietly. Echothan snorted. You'll notice the men I brought with me, he said. Dalinar nodded. He had noticed. No ladies, only lords. Very strange for a supposed social visit. They were Echothan's most powerful tribute lords and neighbors. All of them, like a surprisingly large percentage of the Aleth nobility, had declared themselves neutral in Elokar's bickering with Jezenrosh. Dalinar's refusal to take sides had made them bold. Many men think Elokar acts presumptuously, Echothan said simply. Those are treasonous words, old friend, Dalinar said. It seems our country breeds treasonous words lately, Echothan replied. Some wonder when the fighting will stop. They wonder if we were justified in invading Prala. They wonder if their king has become the same kind of tyrant we fought so hard to defeat two decades ago. Pralir harbored the traitor, Dalinar said simply. And so we invaded, Echothan replied, without diplomacy, without asking for a trial of our king's murderer. We attacked within months of his flight. Dalinar frowned. If there are those who say such things, he noted, one wonders why they didn't join with Jezenrosh. Because Jezenrosh is no better, Echothan said, sipping his wine. The king is wrong to attack his countrymen, but he was right to be wary. Surely you've heard of the way Jezenrosh courted the nobility in Elokar's absence. Besides, Jezenrosh is no leader. Even those who follow him don't give him much respect. The boy's too eccentric, and he has little skill in battle command. Men like him just fine, but they don't want him as their king. I don't see where this is going, Dalinar said wearily. Don't you? Echothan asked. Dalinar, there are many who whisper that a new leader is needed. And that leader is not Jezen Rosh. They need a king they trust, a king respected like no man in Alethkar. Dalinar leaned against the stone rail, feeling a cool wind call through the late, ruffling his clothing. Echothan, I am his portion. I will not betray my king. Echothan didn't answer immediately. No, he finally said. I guess I didn't really think you would. Just know this. When Elokar came to us three years ago, paranoid that Cardinar would rebel at the old king's death and offered us his silly treaty, we did not accept it for him. He suggested Kane for one of his fops. It was I who insisted it be you. I know you've never liked the betrothal, Dalinar, but it was necessary. He paused, then lay a hand on Dalinar's shoulder. Cardinar is loyal to the tyrant Bane. If he rides to arms, then so shall we. There are others who would follow as well. With that, Dechothan left him, and Dalinar bowed his head before the wind, hoping that the Almighty was in its whispers, for he could certainly use some direction. Chapter 43 Jack 7 Minrel struggled to keep her hands steady as she poured the tea. She kept her eyes lowered, but couldn't help glancing up at the man seated at the low table before her. He was so strong of jaw, so determined and aristocratic. How could this man have ever been called the idiot king? It was difficult for Minrel to comprehend. Granted, she had never seen the man up close before this day. She had heard the stories, though. She knew of his transformation. The man before her was less a mortal 
and more a holy being, like a herald. The finger of the Almighty had touched him, taking away his mind sickness and giving the three houses a strong leader in their day of need. He was the idiot king no longer. Already people were whispering of a new title, the Awakened King. There was only one other man in the room, and he sat across the low table from the Awakened King. Minrel moved over, busying her nervous hands to make the shaking less obvious. This man was himself a symbol of King Avon's calling. Everyone knew that the Shin almost never fought beneath the command of a Canaran leader. The arrogant foreigners considered all people of the East to be beneath them. It took a very special individual to earn their loyalty. A man like Jarna the Conqueror. Or like Avon Vedanel. The Shin man watched her with his unnerving eyes. He lifted his cup, his motions fluid and purposeful. Even the way he held his cup seemed graceful. Her hand suddenly slipped as she poured, jerking slightly and disrupting the stream of tea, but the Shin man somehow anticipated the motion and smoothly moved his cup in tandem with her slip. The flow of tea continued uninterrupted, not a drop spilled. The cup full, Minrel gratefully raised her pouring vase. The shin man caught her eye, and Minrel paused. Instead of the cold arrogance she had expected to find therein, the man's eyes were understanding, even comforting in their own way. Standing, Minrel backed away to leave the room. Stay, King Avon commanded. Minrel froze then walked back to the table and knelt beside it, her chest level with its top, as she waited upon her king's call. So what do you think of our new accommodations, assassin? The king asked his companion. The first capital is a fine prize, and not just for the oath gates. There is a fairness and beauty to the buildings that one will not find in any city of Vaden design. The Shin man did not reply, but sipped his tea quietly. The king's words were correct. Ral Aram was a wondrous city. With their graceful columns and cromless angles, its buildings were far more beautiful than those in any Vaden city. Speak, King Avon commanded. I can see the answer in your eyes anyway. Deafness teaches a man to read more than lips, assassin. Deafness? The comment made no sense, but these were important men. There was little doubt they would speak of things far above the understanding of a simple eighth citizen serving girl, barely past the age of her charon. If this city is a place of beauty, the shin man said, his accent making even his words sound graceful. Then... I have trouble seeing it through the blood that drips from its stones. Minrel couldn't suppress a shiver. She had heard the stories, of course. The stories of the city's capture and the slaughter that had occurred. Her father had explained the necessity very sternly. Just like in the stories and ballads, sacrifices had to be made. Enemies were not just those who held spears but any who might resist in their hearts. This was why the king had commanded Vaden's servants be gathered and brought through the oath gate to serve in Ral Aram's palace. And this was why he had ordered the deaths of their Aleph counterparts. And his will was that of the Almighty. Did the awakened king not have power over the oath gates? Did he not command the loyalty of men who should have rightly tried to kill him? Had he not been healed by the Almighty himself? The king chuckled quietly at the Shin man's comment. Do not idealize those who died, assassin. How many people do you think old Nolanarin killed when he captured this city in the name of Alethkar? It is only just that the same destruction should return against them. You speak of justice? 
The Shin Man's words were calm, but there was an insulting tone to them nonetheless. Minrel caught her breath, glancing up toward the dwelling, but no retributive strike fell to destroy the man for his blasphemy against the awakened king. King Avon just laughed again. I am justice, assassin. Has not your blade proven that? After everything that has happened, still you doubt. Ilhadal will not let you live, the Shin man said in a simple, direct voice. The moment his daughter produces an heir of your line, you will be killed. One Shin assassin will not be enough to protect you on that day, idiot king. Perhaps, King Arvin replied, holding out his cup for Minrel to fill again. And, the Shin man continued, if he assumes that you are delaying the production of an heir, he will grow impatient. He has his proof for the moment, King Arvin replied. Ah, yes, the Shin man said. Your stunt with the guards, executed within full sight of the wedding bed, so that rumors of consummation would spread. One wonders how any man could be unresponsive to such treatment of his daughter. One wonders, King Arvin said, how someone could be so ignorant of men's temperaments. Ilhadal Davar is no tal Sheikh, doting on the whims of wife and children. Ilhadal favors the spell of might and the unseen ballad of return. He is a man of ambition, a man who likes his music to contain simple beats performed loudly. To such a man, children are things to be dominated, and a failure of a daughter is a thing to be given only contempt. If I treat her likewise, I will be seen as a man of strength. If that is the truth, then Ilhadal Tavar is a fool, the Shin man said. A fool he is, King Arvin replied. But not for the reasons you assume. Minrel sat very still, trying to look unnoticed. I shouldn't be hearing these things, she thought uncomfortably. But enough banter, the king said. What of the group who escaped? Your scouts are having trouble tracking their movement through the caverns, the Shin man replied. It could take weeks to find them. The king rubbed his chin, which sported a growing beard, something he'd apparently begun to grow only after his awakening. It was already becoming full, however, and was cut after Vaden fashion giving the face the desired squarish look. Do they have a map of the caverns? One that leads them to daylight, the king mused. Or was their flight to the caverns simply an act of desperation? My spies know nothing of this escape method, and they claimed to know a great deal about the palace. Perhaps some of the palace servants could have told you more the shin man said, his eyes hard. King Arvin ignored the jibe. We will have to move quicker, he said. Lady Yasna Kolin is a woman who needs to be dead. If my soldiers had let half the palace escape and killed her as ordered, then I would not be nearly as worried. We cannot risk her alerting her brother. You can't hide a marching army, the shin man said. What does it matter? If she alerts them, we've taken the city quietly, but Elucar's scouts will warn him of your coming. As long as he discovers my armies after he has weakened his forces by fighting his cousin, I will mind little. The joining of their forces is what worries me. And the Colin woman, I have been warned to deal with her. You will take a small force of soldiers and ride around the base of the mountain watching for refugees and openings in the rock. Make certain those caves don't let out somewhere nearby where she could quickly make for cross guard. The woman supposedly took a large number of people with her. She shouldn't be difficult to find. The shin man nodded, rising to his feet. He didn't bow as he walked toward the door. 
Wait, King Arvan said. You have forgotten something. The Shin Man paused, turning back. The girl needs to be dealt with. We have discussed things that need not be passed on to the other servants. Minrel froze. The Shin Man did likewise, his face flashing with the first vivid emotion he had displayed. Hatred. The girl? Me? Dealt with? How? King Arvan reached out, dropping something onto the table. A small blue stone. Minrel scrambled to her feet, suddenly frightened, though she wasn't even sure why. My lord, your majesty, I won't say. The Shin Man was fast. So amazingly fast. Minrel tried to stumble backward, but he caught her, hand going to her throat, and holding it just tight enough to choke off her words. He stood that way for a moment, eyes turned toward the king. Arvin said nothing. Minrel looked toward him, pleading, tears forming at the pain in her throat. This was the Almighty's chosen, the awakened king. He wouldn't. Please. Minrel whispered in voiceless terror as the darkness closed. I hate you, Jack whispered, carefully lowering the servant's corpse to the ground. She was just a girl, a child, really. A child in a land of children. Did that make the sin twice as bad? He looked down at her horrified dead eyes and doubted such a sin could get any worse. He looked up. Avand Vedanar sat calmly. You didn't need to make her stay, Jack accused. Then I would have had to wait for her to return when I wanted more tea, Avan replied. So young. Oshanalakada, must you treat them so? And must I be your hand? Again the words of his banishment returned to him, words spoken by the sacred Holotatanal on the day of his shaming. This is your curse, to be the tool of those who know not truth, to share in their blasphemy but have no will to do otherwise. You are truthless. He represented not only his own desecrated honor, but that of his people as well. I have no truth, Jack whispered, and yet it binds me. There is no truth, assassin, Avan said. Jack stood, looking over at Avin. There was a hunger in the man's eyes. It was almost as if he wanted Jack to break down and abandon his vows, to admit that Avin was right, that there was no honor or truth, and that people were as the birds of Avin's cages, things to be snapped and discarded. Yet what perversity would make the man wish for such a thing? If Jack broke his truthless bindings of honor, then Avon would lose his most efficient servant. Avon met his eyes, then waved him out of the room. Chapter 44 Marin 10 Marin squinted, shading his face from the afternoon sun. His anxious eyes devised enemies where there were probably none. Were those dark spots in the distance riders, or simply another shadow thrown up by a formation in the rock? There were specks on a closer hillside, simple rock buds, or scouts searching for runaway noblings. The late valley cut a great gouge across the land, its green sides twisting into the near distance until it vanished, the slope of the land hiding the depression from view. Marin and Ranarin hadn't dared travel within its soft beauty. Too many people lived along the late's river banks. Even wearing dull shunna cloaks and simple trousers, Marin's blade and plate carefully wrapped and stowed on the pack horse, he and Ranarin were still distinctive. Riders themselves were rare, even along the late, and Ranarin warned that anyone with an eye for horse flesh would recognize their mount's fine breeding. So they cut a path parallel to the late, trying to stay out of sight. 
Two riders were not enough to leave much of a trackable trail on the hard Rosharan stone, and so their greatest danger came from the eyes of the peasants and travellers they passed. "'We shouldn't have done this,' Bernarin said morosely. The boy had a penchant for repetition. "'Well, we did,' Marin said. "'Our only hope now is to return with a living Arador to prove we didn't break our oaths by fighting for either side. Do you see anything?' Renarin shook his head. But I'm not exactly experienced at this. Marin grimaced. It's a wonder we haven't been caught already. It would help if we knew where we were going, he noted. Renarin shook his head, looking down at the black sphere in his hand. He carried it with him everywhere, its smooth surface never far from his caressing fingertips. I know, he mumbled. I just... We haven't had enough time to stop and think. But he has to have come this way, Marin. Father's riders didn't catch him. And if he went south? Marin asked. Toward Rel Aram? Renarin said. Seat of the king? No, he would run afoul of Elokar's messengers and reinforcement lines. Ardor's party was too large. It would have been spotted by enemy scouts. He came north. Marin sighed. But as he had said to Renarin, their time of decision had already passed. They had come north. They had to either press on or turn back and beg forgiveness, and Marin had no intention of returning to Kolinar without Arador. Unfortunately, none of the towns they had visited bore rumors of Lord Arador's passing. That could mean that Renarin was wrong, or it could simply mean that Arador had stayed to the late rim as well. Marin felt blind. He was riding in darkness, trying to feel his way, only he didn't even really know where he wanted to go. Meanwhile, while Marin stumbled about, Arador was in danger. You don't really know that, Marin told himself. Yes, he's probably in danger, but Renarin's premonition is, well, unsubstantial. You don't know Arador is going to die. Still, the youngest Colin's attitude made an eerily convincing argument. Marin turned, glancing at Renarin as the two walked down the short hill that had been their vantage point. Renarin's normally unsettling air had adopted a slightly frantic cast, a remnant from his episode in the Ilinra Temple. The boy fidgeted now, always glancing about with a nervousness that bespoke more than a simple fear of pursuit. When they stopped for the night, Renarin would take up charcoal and scrawl on the stones around them, mumbling to himself. And this is the man I'm trusting to guide me to Arador, Marin thought. Blessed winds! I must be even more disturbed than he. That's Pebbles' perch up ahead, Renarin said as they remounted, nodding toward the late ahead of them. It's a sixth city. Not tributing, but independent. It's the largest town for another two days. We should stop there and look for information. Renarin nodded. Visiting the village would mean exposing themselves to whoever might follow, but what else could they do? Renarin seemed certain that Arador had taken the river somehow, though that seemed incredibly unlikely. As they crested the valley wall and began their way down a switchbacking path, Marin was able to see the river in its entirety. The banks on either side bespoke a water flow that was normally twice as wide, and what did trickle past was hardly navigable. It was several ten-set feet wide, but its flow was slow, and the many protruding rocks and sandbanks proved how shallow it must be. He sailed on that? Marin asked pointedly. Renarin looked up. Then he just shrugged. It would have been a little higher when Arador passed this way, and the river melds with mountain streams to the north. I don't know, Marin. I can only tell you what I saw. Saw how? Marin pressed. In a vision? No, Renarin said. In the patterns of numbers. What does that even mean? Marin protested. Renarin just shook his head. Marin sighed again, letting the matter drop. Pebbles Perch was indeed a large city, though it looked to be in something of a lull. Intricate docks housed a variety of barges and river boats that were mostly grounded. Those that did lie in the water didn't float so much as sit in the mud, sand, and crom, waiting for the return of the fall rains. 
Large embankments stood on either side of the docks to protect the vessels from sudden high storm floods, and most of the ships looked to be under some manner of summer repair. The city obviously drew its living from the river. Large dock houses made up the bulk of the structures, and they gave the city a far less refined look than Kolinar. The streets were arranged in a haphazard, unplanned way, and the buildings lacked general ornamentation. The city must suffer during the summers, Marin said. Renarin shrugged. The spring harvest is in, and the villages have to be given time to bring their grain to the city. By the time the storms come regularly again, those barges will be well stocked and ready to ship their goods downriver for distribution. I would think that they find the cycle refreshing. It gives them a few months every year to stop and think. Something I haven't been able to do lately, his tone implied. As they approached the city, they dismounted and led their horses, hoping that walking instead of riding would make them look less intimidating or memorable. Renarin was right. Despite the lack of river traffic, the city markets were busy. Packmen loaded with reed baskets hiked in careful lines toward the docks. Apparently the massive storehouses were used to keep the grain during the searing. Merchants and lesser noblemen haggled beside stalls and tents, and young boys cried out their master's prices and deals for all to hear. I've never seen this side of it, Marin said. The Inava. I've always kind of wondered what happened to it after we grew it. The world has to eat, Renarin said, and with Prala in ruin, Alethkar has grown rich by its plenty. Marin shuffled uncomfortably. Prala was that important a food producer? Renarin nodded. The part of the country you saw, the highlands, was where the trader chose to fight, but that was only to keep us away from the farmland below. Prala has always been the most productive grower in Roshar. Over the last decade, its various kingdoms have been Alethkar's greatest competition for lucrative sales to Thalena and Vedanar, who mine more but grow less. Very convenient that Prala should come under Aleth control, Marin thought. The more he discovered about the war on the Third Peninsula, the less persuaded he became of Alethkar's moral edge. They stood for a few moments, looking around at the market-goers. Well, now what? Marin finally asked. Renarin shrugged. I don't know. We could always try a tavern, I suppose. That hasn't worked too well so far, Marin said with a grimace. So far, tavern occupants hadn't been very comfortable around the two. Marin wasn't certain what they were doing wrong. Shopkeepers distrusted them immediately, and street-goers were polite but rarely gave them much heed. Marin could probably demand more attention if he revealed his shard blade, but that would ruin any chance of anonymity. There are some beggars over there, Marin said with a nod. The stories always say beggars are great sources of information. When Sadi's sunmaker was alone, separated from his armies after the Battle of Shurrock, he hid among the city beggars, and they contacted his men for him. Renarin frowned, eyeing the bundles of cloth and bone. I don't know. I doubt they're concerned about more than their next meal. They probably just look that way, Marin said. Beggars are always part of the organized criminal underground in big cities. They're the eyes of the local thief lord and keep watch over his interests. Renarin turned his skeptical look from the beggars to Marin. You know, he said, you have some very strange ideas, Marin. Being called strange by Renarin was a discomforting experience. You'll see, Marin insisted, leaving Renarin with their horses and approaching the three beggars. All were older men, though their weathered faces and unkempt beards might have exaggerated their age somewhat. One appeared to be missing his left leg at the knee, but Marin knew from the stories that it was probably just contorted to look that way. Greetings, friends, Marin said in a low voice, squatting down before them. I have need of your uh, specialized services. All three men perked up, their gnarled hands shooting out in hope of alms. Marin reached into his pocket, picking out a sparkling sliver of ruby set in a drop of glass. The hands reached for it, but he pulled it back out of their reach. 
Not yet, he said. First I need information. What information, master? One of the old men said in an eager, lisping voice. Have you seen riders come through this market recently? Marin asked. Yes, many, another beggar said, trying to reach past his companion's hand. This would be a special group, Marin explained. Thirty in number, with an air of nobility. One of particular nobility. He gave the last words special emphasis, eyeing the beggars knowingly. All jokes saw them, the third man said. Yes, I saw them. Riders. When? Marin asked eagerly. The old man paused. Today? He said hesitantly. Today? Marin asked. Surely Marin and Renarin couldn't have gained that much time on Arador. He regarded the beggars through narrowed eyes as the other two began to assert that they too had seen the riders come through today. All three clutched eagerly for the ruby chip. You are playing with me, Marin said with dissatisfaction. No, not playing, the third man promised. Please, my lord, the chip, a chip for old Duke. Ah, I see, Marin thought. Not enough, eh? He reached into his pouch, pulling out a ten Ishmark chip. The three men's eyes widened, and one even started drooling. Now, Marin said, I want specifics. Did Lord Arador come through here or not? What do you know of his travels? The three men were too focused on the chip to say much. Marin moved as if to put it away, and they wailed as one. Yes, we saw him. Lord Arador, he came. With riders, yes. Can we have the chip now? I don't believe you, Marin said. I want to speak with him. The three men paused. Him? One asked. You know, Marin said conspiringly. Him. The one who commands you. Your lord of this city. Our lord, um, my lord? One asked. You? Another said, cocking his head in confusion. Yes, you're a good lord. A chip? A chip? Please, her old juke. Marin sighed, dropping the chip before them. Just tell him what I asked, Marin said, as the three men lurched forward, fighting for the money. Marin retreated back to Renarin, who stood with his onyx sphere held before his eyes, staring at it with absorption. Put that thing down, Marin said with annoyance. You look daft. I'm not the one trying to reason with beggars, Renarin said, lowering the sphere. Marin glanced back at the three men whose struggles were drawing attention from the market-goers. They're staying quiet for some reason, he said. Crafty ones they are. Renarin looked skeptical. Fine, Marin said. What do you want to do? Ask the shopkeepers, Renarin said. Perhaps my brother stopped for supplies. Marin nodded, and Renarin led the way. The sky soon began darkening in the west, the approaching high storm a foreboding sign of their failed progress. None of the shopkeepers seemed to know anything, though again they were hesitant to discuss anything but business. As soon as they determined that Marin and Renarin weren't likely to purchase anything or negotiate for the sale of grain, the shopkeepers turned their attentions to more promising prospects. The two left another futile conference, walking back onto the street. Renarin looked west, frowning. Ice storm coming soon, he noted. Last one before the searing. We'll have to remember to buy some more water before we leave. Marin nodded with resignation. Pebbles Perch was another failure. The late turns east here, Marin said, nodding toward the valley bend ahead. Do we continue to follow it, or keep going north? We stay with the late, Renarin said. He went by river. Marin was too tired to begin another argument. Let's find an inn, he said. We can... Lord Renarin? A man called from behind them. Renarin jumped visibly, and Marin felt a dread certainty that they had been located. When they turned, however, they didn't find Lord Dalinar's soldiers bearing down on them, but instead a short portly man with a red face and an excited expression. Lord Renarin! the man exclaimed. It is you! 
Why, I'd all but decided you weren't coming. Hurry, hurry. The high storm is nearly here. We haven't much time. Marin and Renarin stared at the newcomer for a moment. He was sweating freely, but didn't seem to mind. His movements matched his words, however, as he motioned eagerly for them to follow him. Wait, Marin said. How do you know who we— He trailed off, then looked up with a broad smile. The beggars, he said. You must be their lord. The short man frowned. No, I'm no lord. First citizen, though my father hardly thinks I'm worth the title, I'll say that. Come, lords, we really haven't much time. Lord Arador said that you'd— Lord Arador? Renarin said, stepping forward. You know my brother? Yes, yes. He said you might follow him. He told me that if you did arrive I was to bring you down the river. But really, we haven't any time. Renarin looked to Marin, then started after the excitable man. Marin followed more suspiciously. You say Arador told you we were coming? he asked. He said you might come, my lord, the man said. He didn't know. He thought you might follow, especially you, Lord Marin. He told us to watch for either of you. Indeed, he did. I am Selson, a man well trusted by Lord Arador, if I might say. Now, to the docks! Marin and Renarin followed curiously, leaving behind the market for the equally busy yet far less cacophonous dockside. Their round-bellied guide moved with surprising speed as he wove through the crowd toward a particularly run-down river house. What do you make of this? Marin said, catching up to Renarin. The younger Colin simply shrugged. It sounds like Arador to try and take care of us, even when he's not around. He was right to suspect that we might follow him. But that man... Marin said, pointing as their guide ducked into the building, his voice echoing inside. You trust him? I'm not sure, Renarin said. You might want to— He nodded toward the horses. Right, Marin said, reaching back and pulling his shard blade free from their packs. It created an immediate disturbance as dock workers paused in their loading, staring at the massive blade. So much for anonymity, Marin whispered resting the blade on his shoulder and walking toward the dockhouse. Selson popped back out before they could step inside. Hurry, he said. Follow! And he was off again. Marin turned back to Renarin with a resigned look and both followed after the man. The dockhouse sides opened behind them as a group of workers pulled back the wooden gates. This particular building was fortunate enough to be built close enough to the river that even the receded water line abutted its sides. However, Marin's suspicions about the river's depth were proven true as Selson leaped into the river. He was a short man, and the water only came up to his knees. Hurry, lads! Selson yelled at the dockhouse. A group of ten young men were pulling a small vessel out of the housing. It looked something like a sleek barge. It was wide and flat, tapering to a point at the front. It slid slowly into the water, where the young men continued to tug on ropes, drawing the vessel farther out into the river. What is that? Marin demanded of the little man. A ship, Selson said. Jern, Recklin, get their things and stow them on the calmness. You two, my lords, should hurry up. Into the river? Marin asked. You mean for us to walk out there with you? Never mind getting your feet wet, the little man said with a chuckle. The rest of you will join them soon. Come on! The little man turned and jumped forward, following his pullers deeper into the river. Eventually the ship began to float. Barely. The waters came up to the pullers' chests as they neared the center of the river, out beyond the dock's protective embankments. By the winds, Marin whispered. He's a storm rider. That's what the ship is. As if to mark Marin's words, the ship suddenly unfurled a pair of thick, rectangular sails set in stout, stumpy masts. I've heard stories of them, Marin said. Men who try to ride the waves of a high storm's flood. Some in ships, others on barges, some even in barrels. Indeed, Renarin said, then promptly stepped off the dock to begin wading toward the ship. Renarin! Marin said, reaching out. 
Behind him, the packmen had unloaded their horses and were moving into the river as well. Hey! Marin snapped as he saw one carrying his bundled set of shard plate. The men ignored him, however, in their hurry to join their companions. Quickly, young lords! the stumpy man yelled from the river's center. Very little time now! Marin turned toward the ominous western sky. Then he turned east, looking down the late valley with its weak river. That river would soon be filled with a crashing wave of water. The late was too wide for it to be of much damage to the city or docked ships, but a vessel left out when the floodwaters came? All of the storm rider tales ended the same way, with a destroyed ship and a set of dead occupants. Told around the hearth, they had been funny tales to a young boy who had never seen river or late, and the storytellers had always exaggerated the folly of those foolish enough to try and survive sailing during a high storm. Marin closed his eyes as Selson called for him again. I'll probably make one bolder of a tale, he thought. The young soldier who saved the king then got himself killed trying to storm ride. He stepped into the water anyway, following after Renarin. This is stupid, he called at his friend. Renarin, I've seen the floodwaters in Kolinar. No ship could survive that. Renarin! Renarin had reached the vessel, and Selsen stood on one side, helping him up. The air was already cooling, the winds picking up slightly, and the river water seemed to be moving more swiftly. "'It'll be all right, young lord,' Selsen said. "'I've done this twice already.' "'It's madness,' Marin insisted. "'No, you see,' Selsen said as Marin approached. "'I know the secret.' Everyone else tries to ride the wave of water that comes with the storm. But us, we're not going to do that. The winds, they're the key. They'll push this ship forward even in three feet of water. The sails are angled. They lift us up, and we skim just on top of the water. Have you ever skipped rocks on the river, young lord? No, Marin said flatly. Oh, well. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Come on up. Marin stood in the cool water, staring at the vessel. It was so thin, so frail. Though its well-built sails gave an illusion of strength, Marin had felt summer high storms. Renarin was letting two of the servants lash him to a seat near the side of the vessel. Come on, Marin, he said, eyes alight. I told you he went by river, and I was right. I saw it. I was right. This is madness, Marin muttered again, but didn't complain as two dockhands hoisted him onto the deck. He stood dripping as one motioned for him to lash down his shard blade. Selson stood, a broad, almost maniac smile splitting his face. The high storms are like giant waves, you see, he whispered with an eager voice. Massive waves of wind and water that sweep across the land. First east to west, then back west to east again, reversing direction with each storm. They're like, like a broom being pulled across the stones. We're just going to let ourselves be a speck of dust caught in that broom's tines. He winked. Trust me, it's terribly fun. Terrible, Marin said sickly. Somehow he suspected this was going to be far worse than the time Arador had made him gallop on horseback. Two men lashed him into place, then they began adjusting ballast, the captain yelling at them to be quick as he watched the oncoming storm with a mixed nervous excitement. Here she comes, Selson finally yelled. Back, lads, out of the floodway. The dockhands scattered, leaving the insane vessel bobbing slightly in the shallow waters. Marin turned with apprehension as a rushing sound approached. He could see the rain wall streaking toward them. Behind it roared a massive crushing wave of rumbling liquid. It frothed and beat upon itself like a pulsating beast of brown and white, its howl that of screaming winds. The only trick to this all is steering, Selson called. If I take us the wrong direction, we'll be caught in the winds and ripped to pieces. Marin gulped. What do we do if that happens? He screamed over the water's roar. Selson smiled, catching Marin's eye. If that happens, lad, he bellowed, hold your breath. The winds hit a second later. Bornism didn't speak much of the afterlife. 
The monks said that it was not man's place to worry about the next life, but that his focus should be on this one. The mortal life was where man faced his challenges, and to the Vorans those challenges were manifest in the danger of the storm shades. The returns were finished. Vornism now taught, but there was much that could be learned from the past. The Chosen themselves were a metaphor. When the storm shades threatened, men had been forced to live within the precepts of society, not creating chaos or fighting against other men, for all of humankind had a far greater enemy to face. Men needed that same unity in everything they did. If one pressed the monks to speak about the afterlife, they simply explained that living well, remaking oneself by transforming the ten carnal attributes into the ten divine attributes, would assure a man rewards. The Ilinra priests were more forthcoming. They whispered of the Almighty's dwelling, the radiant gathering of stars that shone in the night sky. The dwelling was said to be at the very center of that collection of stars, where the points of light were so thick that one couldn't distinguish space between them. That place of light and peace was where the souls of good men would find rest. There were other places, too. One, Cathar, was a place of fire and smoke. Cathar was the land of the storm shades, and the Ilinra taught that this was a land where the souls of men who did not follow the Almighty were punished. There was a place even worse, however, the Deep, a place reserved for men who professed allegiance to the Almighty, but who were evil in their hearts. This was a place of special suffering, a land of dark coldness, a land of madness. Merrin hadn't expected to find himself there. But where else could he be than the deep? What had he done that he would lie bound, his screams lapped up by the high storm's roar, his face beaten by both rains and the crashing waves from the river below? The wind of the tempest pushed from behind, but it was doubled by passing air to the sides, a wind created as their boat moved at a ridiculous speed over the waters. Cities, dark from the clouds overhead, blipped past like drops of forgotten rain. If men in them watched the river, they might have seen fools caught in a perpetual roar of destruction. They might have heard screams of terror over the wind. But they probably didn't. Fortunately, unconsciousness took Marin before madness could. The feeling of wet soreness that awakened him was worse even than the pain he had felt on his second day in the army. Marin felt as if a ten set of spearmen had taken their practice weapons and beaten him repeatedly. He groaned, water dripping from his mouth. He would have vomited, but he had freed his stomach of its contents before the first few minutes of travel had passed. Oh, first time's the worst, you know, Selson's voice quipped from a short distance away. Marin opened sodden eyes, lifting his face from the wooden plank. His bonds had been loosed, but he could barely move anyway. Hand me my sword, he mumbled. I'm going to kill you. Selson laughed. Marin groggily located the man standing on the deck a short distance away, fiddling with some ropes near the sails. Thought we'd overshoot there for a moment. Almost couldn't get these knots undone. That's the really tricky part. Anyone can start, but stopping? Well, that takes a smooth hand. Have to find an open place where the storm flood weakens, then cut the sails and ride it out. But we made it. My men should have seen us pass. They'll be here soon. Marin managed to sit. His head hurt worst of all, and he blinked in the waning light. It was dusk, and they seemed to be floating on a random section of the river, no buildings in sight. Where are we? he asked. Near Jesnorn, the man said. About fifty miles north of Crossguard. Marin froze, pain forgotten for a moment. Fifty miles north of— But that trip could take weeks on foot. How long were we— Usually takes about five hours, Selson said happily. Halfway across the kingdom in five hours. 
Marin had marched that same distance in the army and had taken more than three weeks. Selson noticed his wonder. He waddled near, then stooped down, grinning. This is it, you see, young lord, the future. No more waiting for messengers on horses, no. We have a new way of traveling, new, bright, and wondrous. New, bright, and insane, Marin mumbled, rubbing his bruised right arm. Besides, what if you want to send a message south instead of east or west? Or what if you want it delivered during the summer, when days pass without storms? In fact, what if you don't happen to live near a lake at all? Selson rubbed his chin. I'm working on a way to do it without the river, he said, though I haven't quite decided how to do it without the storm. That part's kind of central to the strategy, eh? Marin lurched to his feet, stumbling over to where Renarin still lay, wet and unconscious. You're crazier than a rock with no name, Marin said, patting Renarin's cheek and trying to wake him up. Ha! You don't know how lucky you are. Why, poor Arador, he had to come on the big ship. The big ship? Marin asked, turning. Sure, Selson said. This gal, the calmness, is the design ship. I built it first as a kind of model, then built the larger version that Arador rode. He had so many men with him that we couldn't fit them all on the little ship. Safer, true but not half as exciting. Marin closed his eyes. Ignore him, ignore him. You're alive and you're near Crossguard. He turned back to Renarin, who was beginning to stir. Renarin opened his eyes, groaning. So this is what they do to boys who disobey their fathers, he mumbled as Marin helped him up. He paused, freezing, then reached for his pocket with an urgent motion. He pulled free the onyx sphere with a sigh of relief. Ah, there they are, Selson said, pointing toward a group of riders descending the late slope. They're good men. Much obliged, like I am, to Lord Arador's generosity. We'll give you a pair of horses to replace the ones you left at the perch, and you can be on your way. You could be to cross garden a few days if you ride hard. Marin sighed at the thought of more traveling. He looked at Renarin, who didn't look much better. But Renarin was right. Arador did come by river. A clever guess, given what Arador had said back in Kolinar, or... something else? Let's go, Renarin said. We need to find him as quickly as possible. Chapter 45 Yasna, 10. At first, Yasna thought that the spark of sunlight was a trick of the caves. During their week long passage through darkness, she had occasionally seen promising glints of light up ahead, only to discover a shard of quartz jutting from the cavern wall, its crystalline surface deceptively reflecting their lantern light. She had almost begun to think the caverns eternal, that she had led the frightened palace servants from a quick slaughter to a slow creeping death by starvation. The mountain was an oppressive tyrant around them, its endless passages misleading, almost maddening. Surely men were not meant to delve its secrets. This place with its dripping waters, its twisted rock formations, and its darkened corners should be death to those who arrogantly thought to navigate its paths. One thing, however, kept the servants from bending beneath the weight of uncertainty and gloom. Taln always seemed to know where he was going. When they reached a merging of caverns or tunnels, he instantly picked a direction, prodding them on with his sheer force of decisiveness. Men did not grumble when Taln led, and women did not question. Yasna was amazed at how easily they followed, how quick they were to smile and forget their pains when the daily march was through. Theirs should have been a desolate company, their kin slaughtered, their home ransacked, their lives in question. Instead of despair, however, 
she saw in them a stalwart determination, and with resignation, she could only determine one source for their resilience. They believed him. Tom guided them firmly. He cared for their wounded, showing a surprising level of medical proficiency. He spoke to them with confidence, ignoring Meridas's frequent suggestions that the troop was headed to its doom. Tom spoke of heralds and storm shades, of the return and the need to defend mankind. Yasna cringed at every such profession, his mental problems forcing her to acknowledge that despite his competence, he was not a man who could be trusted with extended leadership. Many of the servants, however, didn't share her apprehension. She could blame them little. Considering their sufferings, any hint of hope was of value. She became certain, however, that when, if, they escaped the caves, she would need to adopt a firmer stand with Tom, lest he infect the others with his delusions. Meridas presented his own problem. Her refusal to recognize their wedding had angered him, and though he was civil, she could see his frustration. Though he was by far the ranking nobleman in the group, he had been wrong about the passages and couldn't very well demand leadership when he didn't know the way. His barbs against Talm were plentiful and snide, but he didn't attempt to give flagrant commands. He was clever enough to understand that the madman was their only chance to escape. Indeed, Meridas found himself isolated by necessity. There were few nobles in the group, and besides Yasna and Kemnar, none were very high in rank. Kemnar's guards were all nineteenth or twentieth lords, professional guards, well beneath Meridas's consideration. Yasna's ladies-in-waiting were little better. That only left two sixteenth lords, palace couriers, who had been absorbed into the group during the escape. Meridas quickly appropriated these two to be his adjuncts, but they were hardly fitting confidants. Despite Meridas's cool demeanor, Yasna could see that the situation grated upon him. He didn't like feeling subordinate, and he shot occasional hateful looks at Tom. Once the group reached safety, Meridas would also have to be controlled, lest he act on his frustration and try to kill Tom. So, when the sunlight ahead was finally confirmed, Yasna knew she had to act quickly. She pulled herself up, trying not to think about her bruised feet and aching muscles. Even as the citizens piled from the cave opening, exulting in the open sky and waning evening light, Yasna approached Meridas and Talm, who stood at the back of the crowd. The two men were eyeing each other with hostility. Their reasons for truce had just expired. No, Yasna commanded. The men glanced at her, but kept wary watch on each other. Meridas's hand was at his side, white smoke curling as his blade was summoned. Stay out of this, Yasna, Talm said. I will try not to kill him. Meridas smiled at that. Why do you need that sword so badly, Tom? Yasna asked. Aren't you worried that he'll kill you? Who will fulfill your quest if that happens? Tom shook his head, dismissing Yasna's argument. The odds now are not as good as they were at the feast. I need that sword. I'll have to risk death for the good of the very quest you mention. Yasna ground her teeth as Meridas raised his blade. You need the weapon to determine where your brothers are, correct? It will point you in their direction? Yes, Tom said. So you only need to hold it for a moment, right? Tom paused. Yes, he admitted. Yasna turned to Meridas. What? the nobleman asked with amusement. You expect me to give my weapon over to the madman? Only for a few heartbeats, Yasna said. That's long enough to kill a man, Meridas said. Yasna rolled her eyes. I'll take both blades, then stick his in the ground near the cave entrance. Then I'll give yours to him. If it looks like he's going to try and attack, you can run over and take the one from the ground. 
We'll let him hold it for a count of a hundred. Then he has to give it back. Meridas smiled. Ah, my dear Lady Yasna, you forget. I am a simple merchant by heart. What have I to gain from such a bargain? Why would I let him hold my blade, if only for a moment? There is nothing in it for me. You are wrong, Yasna countered. There is something in it for you. Meridas raised his eyebrows. Yasna gritted her teeth. She had considered this bargain during the length of their trip in darkness. Meridas was a shrewd businessman, if nothing else. She had only one gem to offer, and even it would be a gamble. I'm sorry, Nell Shendon, she thought silently. There is something you want, Meridas, Yasna said. Me. We are not married yet. If you ever intend to see that ceremony completed, then you should be wary of offense. I will not look favorably upon a suitor who ignores my will in this matter. Meridas snorted. Suitor? Your brother has already given you to me, my dear. The betrothal, at least, is still official. It was official as long as Elokar had me locked in his palace, Yasna replied. He no longer has that palace, and the only guards I see here are my own. I could be persuaded to see my brother's will in this matter, if it were for the good of Alethkar. But make no mistake, I will not again put myself in a position where I will be forced to wed. If you wish my hand, then you will need to convince me that such a union should occur. Meridas paused, frowning slightly. Town was still tense, newly captured shard blade gripped before him. Both, however, were considering her proposal. Yasna sighed at the necessities of sating masculine pride. One would think that a god and a parson would be a little less childish. Unfortunately, she wasn't finished yet. It would do her no good to solve this argument if she just had to quell another one on the morrow. There is one more thing, my lords, Yasna said forcibly, drawing their attention back to her. Lords, Meridas asked, emphasizing the plural. He holds a blade now, Meridas, Yasna said, taken from a shard bearer in battle, taken falsely, Meridas spat. He took it in the defense of Alethkar's people, Yasna said. Something you did not seem very concerned about doing. We will see which man retains his blade once I tell my brother how you walked away, leaving me to fend for myself in a palace filled with enemy soldiers. Meridas's frown deepened. Yasna sighed. My lords, the first city has fallen, and our king's back is exposed to an enemy he doesn't know exists. There is no time for squabbling. We need to act decisively. This troop, wearied though it is, must bring word to my brother. We can't afford to be divided. We need one leader, not three. That leader will be me. Excuse me, Meridas asked. Tom didn't respond, though his eyes narrowed slightly. You will be in command of the group, Meridas, as befits your rank. Yasna said. But I will decide where we go and what we do. It is vital that we get word to my brother and that we do so without revealing ourselves. Talm, you get to hold Meridas's blade for a hundred heartbeats. Meridas, you get my hand in betrothal. In exchange, you will both do as I say until such time as my kingdom has been rescued from its invaders. You promise to accept the marriage? Meridas asked carefully, speaking with the tongue of a merchant. By your oath? Yasna's stomach twisted. Yes. I cannot give myself over to your command, Tom said. I need to seek my brethren. What will be faster? Yasna asked. Seeking them on your own without having touched your blade? or seeking them with both your blade and the messengers of a grateful king to serve you. Protect me now during our time of need, 
and I will see that you have the resources of Alethkar at your disposal. She was making many promises. Difficult promises. It was only after she was done, Talne and Meridas considering their separate rewards, that she realized she was doing it again, protecting Alokar. It had proven her folly once before, and because of her oversight, Nelshendon and Shinri were dead. No, she told herself forcefully. This is for Alethkar, not my brother. I will not see the kingdom of my father's fall to invasion. Very well, Meridas suddenly declared, stabbing his blade point first into the stone ground. In the distance, the peasants were resting from their journey, Brother Lon distributing the evening rations, Kemnar's soldiers at his side. Kemnar himself had edged closer to Yasna's conference, eyes glittering with curiosity. He stood, Yasna noted, within distance of striking at Meridas, should the man prove dangerous. I will give you a hundred days, Town finally decided. If we have no success by that time, then I must seek my brethren alone. It was the best she was going to get. Very well, Yasna said. Swear to obey my will. Swear it by the tenth name. Kevahin, Meridas whispered. Kevahin, Town said. Yasna nodded, and Meridas turned, leaving his blade in the stone. One hundred heartbeats, he said. You need not take his own blade away. I trust him. His eyes said he believed nothing of the sort. Yet he walked away anyway, back turned to Talm, as if daring the madman to strike against him. Talm ignored the retreating nobleman. The false herald rammed his blade in the ground, then grabbed Meridas's abandoned weapon with a reverent touch. She heard him whisper something under his breath, a single word that sounded like a name. Then he grew apprehensive, almost uncertain. His grip stiffened with determination, and he raised the blade in two hands. There was a pause. Finally, he exhaled in relief. It works, he said. The blade's powers remain, even if mine do not. He raised the point of the blade, turning it to the northwest. There. That direction. Yasna frowned. Talm, there's nothing but wilderness to the west. Talm glanced up, judging the position of the stars as they began to appear. Remak, he said. The kingdom of Remak fell hundreds of years ago, Yasna said. That land is nothing more than a back country of despots and isolated villages. You know that. You came from Remak. She left the last part off. That is where they are, nonetheless, Town said. Joravan. They must have gathered there. Yasna frowned. Joravan, the holy city, had once been the center of Vorin power. It was sacked soon after Remak fell. A local tyrant now controls the Oath Gate. Why would my brethren gather there? Talm asked, as if her comments were made in line with his own strange reasonings. And send me no word. What do they know that I do not? Could they have foreseen that Ral Aram was doomed? Balear Elin is an onyx seer. If his powers still work, then perhaps. Talm looked over at her, then jammed the sword back into the ground. We must go there, to Joravan. We must know what they know. Talm, I, he held up a hand. I know, you do not believe me. We must go there nonetheless. Besides, where else would we go? That. We must decide, Yasna said. Go and get your monk friend. I will return Meridas's blade to him. If Tom speaks correctly, then we are here, Kemnar said, placing a small rock on the map he had scratched into the stone ground. 
Firelight illuminated the white scrapings. Across the short plateau, Yasna's people had been arranged into a ten set different camps, each with their own fire. Their wood, taken from water barrels and boxes of food, would not last long, but they deserved a warm meal following the extended trek through darkness. They would worry about supplies later. Around the fire with Yasna sat Taln, Lan, Meridas, Kemnar, and, at Taln's suggestion, a broad-figured palace maid named Denia. Yasna vaguely knew the woman for her gossipy ways and reputed firmness with her undermaids. During their journey, Denia had somehow become the unofficial leader of the citizens. Yasna studied the map. The Mount of Ancestors was represented by a massive circle drawn at the bottom. A rock on its eastern side represented Ral Aram. Tom placed their group directly on the other side of the mountain on its western side. She found it amazing that they had traveled so far, bypassing the entire mountain. If it were known that such a direct path lay beneath Ral Aram, a short distance to their west, lay the border between Alethkar and the Remak Wilds. The demarcation ran directly to the north. Crossguard, Jezenrosh's palace, and the probable location of Elokar's army lay on the far eastern side of the country. It would take weeks to reach it. We can't make directly for Crossguard, Kemnar said, voicing her own thoughts. Not only is it too far, but we can probably assume that King Avon plans to do more than simply take Ral Aram. If he strikes at Elokar now, he could take the entire country. The Vadens will likely be moving toward Crossguard in an attempt to strike at Elokar's forces from behind. If we go directly east, we have a good chance of broadsiding their army, and their scouts will undoubtedly see us before we see them. Agreed, Meridas said. The battle at Crossguard is probably already finished. His Majesty planned to strike quickly and efficiently. However, such a plan likely cost him considerable troops. If the Vadens take him in the open with Crossguard destroyed... We have to get him word, Yasna agreed. Suggestions? Kolinar, Kemnar said, placing a rock along the curving late he had drawn. is almost directly north of us and Lord Dalinar has considerable forces at his command, forces that are rested and well-equipped. If we can alert him, his messengers could probably get word to King Elokar in time. That's still several weeks' march, my lords, Lan noted. The people are tired. Could we find nothing closer? We should go to the first village we can find, Yasna said. We can drop off the peasants there, appropriate some horses, and then ride for Kolinar. Taln shook his head. Dangerous, he said. Why? Yasna asked. This Vaden, King Arvan, Taln said. He was clever enough to get access to the Oath Gates, then strategic enough to capture the palace quietly. We can assume he holds the city now, and he will be very disappointed to find that you, my lady, and Lord Meridas are missing. His soldiers know someone was in the cellars and that they disappeared. We didn't have time to mask our presence there. They will see the dust scuffed where we removed barrels and boxes. They know we escaped. The group fell quiet, the maid Denia's face paling slightly. You think we're being followed? Lord Talonel. I know it, Talon said. I heard echoes in the caverns. We lost them early, but they will eventually find their way through the maze. There are a few exits, and all of them come out on this side of the mountain. If the Vaden king is half as clever as his attack implies, he will have spies watching this side of Althkar, to make certain that his surprise attack on King Elokar is not spoiled. Tom bent down, pointing at the map. He'll expect us to head north to Kolinar. That then is the thing we absolutely cannot do. If the situation is as you imply, 
Then he will be less worried about warning the king and more worried about warning the surrounding lords who did not ride to war against Jezenrosh. Elokar will know of Avan's force soon enough. King Avan's task will be to force a battle with Elokar before Alethkar can gather reinforcements. In order to succeed, he must control the information between Elokar and his allies. Kemnar rubbed his chin. He has a point, my lady, he said. The Vadens will probably strike quickly at King Elokar, then move on to take the separate lords one at a time. They'll probably lay siege to some of the larger late cities and spend considerable time hunting scouts and messengers. Then that means we have to get word to Kolinar all the more quickly, Yasna pointed out. No, Tom said. It means we need to be careful. We cross the mountain quickly, but the invaders have horses. They will have riders watching for refugees all across Alethkar and those riders will have orders to kill. Elokar himself sealed the oath gates, and since he is probably using awakeners to supply food, he won't need a supply line, and information from the capital will not be a priority. The rivers do not flow during this searing. The invaders will probably allow visitors into Ral Aram. They will just stop traffic from going out. Information will be slow to spread. By the time anyone hears that the oath gates have fallen, your king will be dead. What, then, do you suggest, madman? Meridas said with a snort. You say we need to inform the king's allies, but you claim we cannot ride to them lest we reveal ourselves. Town moved his finger a few inches, crossing the border into Remak. These are wilds, he said poorly inhabited and solitary. If we head northward through them, instead of up through Alethkar proper, we have a much greater chance of remaining unseen. We can still send messengers to Elokar from the villages we pass, but we must do so quietly, without telling the city inhabitants of our identities. Then we can cut back into Alethkar and travel to Kolinar from the west, instead of the south. It loses us a week's travel, perhaps, but the gain in safety is far greater than the loss. Yasna narrowed her eyes. That path takes us conveniently close to the ruins of the holy city, Tom, she said. Tom shrugged. Does that make it any worse a plan? Kemnar looked up. It does seem sound, my lady. She knew it did. There was a reason Elokar had trusted her with his army's tactics. She saw Tom's explanations and knew that they were right. King Avan's army would act as Tom suggested, being careful to isolate Elokar from his allies. Avan would have scouts on the major roads, watching for refugees or for messengers. They would kill any riders they saw, trying to sow confusion and keep his secrets as long as possible. Yasna's troop was hardly inconspicuous. Even once they abandoned the peasants, Tal and Kemnar had shard blades that could not be dismissed, and Meridas carried himself too much like a nobleman. Riding through Alethkar, it would take a miracle for them to reach Kolinar safely. Remak, however, with its unkempt roads and sparse population, would mask their travel quite well. Yasna nodded. I will consider it, Yasna said. First, we need to find a village and some horses. Then we can decide upon a final path. Yasna huddled on the frigid stones, her back to a boulder, watching the pitiful remnants of the once fire smolder before her. The wood hadn't lasted long, barely long enough to give a reminder of warmth, something near forgotten during their ten days in the dank mountain confines. Her wedding slippers were in tatters, and the once beautiful dress had fared little better. She'd been forced to allow Kemnar to rip it up the side, so that she could walk with a masculine stride, and the fine tassels and frills had not been designed for extended use. She was cold, sore, 
and hungry. The night was cool. They were still at a relatively high elevation, and the mountainside provided little shelter from the wind. The people lay huddled together, clothed only in what they had been wearing when they escaped. Several of the women, like Yasna, didn't even have cloaks. Yet her personal problems were secondary to those facing the group as a whole. The coals couldn't help but remind her of the difficulties to come. So much wood to burn bespoke empty food stores, more than half depleted. They were horribly low on water, and this was the searing. Rain wouldn't fall for another two weeks. Even then it would come with the most furious tempest of the year, the Almighty's bellow. She had to find the people shelter by then. Being caught on the stormlands during the bellow would certainly bring death to the weakened and young in the troop. Footsteps scuffed rocks behind her. There's an odd place, our Roshar, Tom's voice noted. Even during the searing, the hottest month of the summer, the night winds chill to the soul. Perhaps it's the lack of vegetation. There's no humidity, nothing to keep the heat in. This is such a lonely, barren rock of a world. Yasna frowned as the madman crouched beside the coals, stirring them with a half-charred piece of wood. What are you talking about? she asked. Tarn shook his head. Nothing that matters anymore, I suppose. Yasna eyed him for a moment his broad form illuminated only slightly by starlight and the weak coals. Tell me, she finally asked, how did you remember your way through those caves? I presumed us lost a ten set times over, yet you found the exit. You must have traveled its depths many times. Tarn shook his head. Only once, he said quietly. Yasna raised an eyebrow. You memorized a map, then? Even still, navigating that well from memory was quite a feat. I should like to see the map itself sometime. There is no map. As far as I know, I'm the only one to ever travel through those caverns and see the other side. The passage we went through wasn't really meant to be an escape from the palace. It was built to hide things. The last time I traveled those tunnels, I did so by chance, tracking a traitor who is now centuries dead. I followed him for seven days, and when the trail ended, I found only a corpse, dead of thirst. Yasna frowned. That's a ridiculous story, Tom. How could you possibly find your way out of those caverns after wandering them for seven days? It's a hard thing to explain, he said quietly. A stone ward can feel the rocks, much like a wind runner can sense movements in the air, or an onyx seer can see the patterns of time itself. Fortunately, I remember the path I once took, for the stones are silent to me now. Yasna sat incredulously, trying to comprehend how a man could say such words and sound so believing. And yet, Tarn offered no further explanation, and she knew by now that confronting him about his madness was useless. She settled back against her boulder, but it was impossible to find a comfortable position. The quiet sounds of laughter floated over the plateau, and Yasna glanced to the side. Only one fire still burned. Meridas had appropriated the last of their wood for his own needs, and now sat presiding over a small gathering of nobility. Tenin and Chathan, the two palace couriers, and Yasna's three ladies-in-waiting sat around his flames, as did one of Kemnor's soldiers. Meridas held himself slightly aloof, seated munificently beside the fire, directing the conversation. Yasna shook her head. We sit without provisions hunted and exposed to the weather, and he acts as if he were a feasting king. He gives them comfort, Tom said with a shrug. He reminds them that they're special, for here, away from courts and balls, they have little else to give them strength. 
Yasna snorted. She suspected that, comfort or no, both the citizens and nobility of their group would be better off without Meridas to remind them of their differences. You would really marry him? Tom asked. The question caught her off guard. She masked her instant revulsion to the concept, turning back to Tom with a calm expression. To save Alethkar? Yes. Besides, I could hardly ask for a better union, though he needn't be informed of that fact. Ah, Tom said, nodding with the expression of one who thought he understood things. Not for myself, idiot, she snapped. For Aleth Carr. Meridas is my brother's closest adviser. As a Parshan's wife, I could keep an easy eye on both of them. And, perhaps, revenge myself upon them. Tarn frowned slightly. You used to speak of your brother with such devotion. What changed? Yasna paused. When had she spoken of Elokar to Tom? Hoping the darkness covered her slight flush at his astute question, she glanced away. It is of no concern to you, madman. He sat quietly for a moment. You should sleep, he finally said. We'll need our strength in the days to come. She turned back coldly. Wise words from a man who sits awake himself. I don't need as much sleep as normal people, Tom said. I shouldn't need any at all, actually. But something has changed. This return, things are different. I can no longer draw strength from places I once could. Yasna frowned, and a sudden curiosity struck her. This man before her seemed so simple, yet his mind was keen, except for the strange taint of madness. He appeared able to separate the two pieces of his life, functioning with capability, even cleverness, when the need arose. But he clung unwaveringly to his delusions at the same time. What had happened in his life to create such a division? What had broken this mind that seemed so confident, so strong? What was it supposed to do? she asked. The sign? Tarn raised his eyebrows, her question as unexpected as his about marriage. It is something Prael Elin devised. The Elin have a bond within them, a link to the Nael and the soul tones. We can manifest this if we wish. The bond appears like a scattering of thousands upon thousands of tiny lines of light extending into oblivion from the center of our bodies. Beautiful golden threads, each one a life. He sighed, pulling something from a pocket in his cloak. It was a tiny piece of amber, one that looked like it had once been the knob to a chest or closet. He rubbed it wistfully. The bond, he finally said, appears to have been weakened. I dare not fear destroyed. I can draw no power from it. It is odd that I should seek for abilities lost while you hide and suppress what you have obviously been given. Yasna flushed again. She felt exposed before this man, and she nearly hated him for it. He had seen the secret that before interrogating the assassin with Kemnar and Nelshenden, she had shown to only one man. Tarn had a power over her she hadn't entrusted to even her father or brother. Why do you hide it? Tarn asked, pressing the issue despite her obvious anger. You will speak no further of this topic, Yasna commanded. Very well, Tarn said. Though... I can't help wondering if your opinion will change if you see these people starving when you could have made them grain, or freezing when you could make the very rocks burn. Such things require far more skill than I have, she said. Tom shrugged. If you lack skill, it is likely because you haven't seen fit to develop what the Almighty has given you. 
Your soul tone must resonate strongly, or you would never have been able to open the lock on the passage. It was made to respond only to heralds. Yasna felt a chill that was not of the winds. How can you speak like that of awakening? She hissed. You profess to be a man of wisdom, a man sent of gods, and yet you encourage me to let it take my soul? You know what it does to people? How it twists their minds? How it changes them? Tom actually dared smile at the comment. Everything changes us, Lady Colin. Can you honestly say that our escape did not alter you forever? Slightly change the way you regard the world? In a small way, does not every person you meet leave their own small mark on your life? That's different. Is it? Tan asked. Ask yourself this. Is the physical act of awakening what changes its practitioners? Or are those changes simply a reaction to new experiences? Once a man's vision expands, and he learns to see things as they are and not as they appear, will he not begin to react differently? Does awakening change them, Yasna? Or do they change themselves? I can't answer that, Yasna snapped. Tan smiled. You could. Then he rose, unclasping his simple cloak, and extending it toward her as he passed. Take it, he prompted as she hesitated. The cold doesn't bother me. Her pride urged her to refuse, but her aching back and shivering arms proved more persuasive. She accepted the cloak, wrapping herself in the warm shenna as Talon wandered over to join Kemnar on watch. Chapter 46 Shinri 8 A creak in the darkness made Shinri pause, her body tense. It was, of course, nothing. After a moment of anxious listening, she forced herself to relax. She needed sleep. She had been so tired and drowsy last afternoon that she hadn't been able to think properly. Yet when night came, she again found herself unable to sleep even in the vast comfort of the queen's chambers. Sighing, Shinri sat up in the bed, resting against the backboard with her legs pulled up against her chest. Avan had not come for her since that first horrible day, but she did not doubt that he would eventually return. He needed an heir to seal his pact with Shinri's father. She didn't know what kept the idiot king away, whether it be simple busyness, or whether he feared her father might send assassins against him once an heir arrived. Whatever the reason for the delay, she blessed the Almighty for it. She glanced to the side, toward the wooden bedstand that formed a shadowy blot in the darkness beside her, and thought of the knife she had hidden beneath its lip. It had seemed like such a brave move in the daylight, but in the darkness, she wondered if she'd have the will to use the weapon if Avan did come for her. The man had a strange power to him, a domineering will, a momentum. When she met him in the hallways, she made sure to stop and lower her eyes. She told herself the subservience was simply an act, a way of making him believe that she had been quelled. And yet... She knew that his arrogant humiliations of her had been at least marginally effective. When she cringed at his sudden motions, she wasn't completely feigning. And when she glanced down in his presence, she did so partially because she loathed looking into those calm eyes of his. She was not beaten, but she had been wounded. It was worst at night. Night, when she lay in bed, not knowing if he would come or not, and not knowing what she would do if he did. Even still, after weeks without a visit, she could feel his dry touch on her skin. She felt him upon her when she closed her eyes, and she heard his footsteps in every night sound. There was little wonder that the insomnia of her childhood had returned. And now, 
the first palace had become his. It had never been a place of true comfort to Shinri, but it had become home. It was the place where Yasna had made a lady from a wild and insufferable child, and it was the first place that Shinri had found acceptance. Yet when she walked its hallways now, she saw only signs of him, his servants, his soldiers, his palace. He'd moved into the Vaden wing, and while it was similar to the Aleth section, the similarities only made the differences feel more alien. She had returned to the Aleth section only once. The bodies had been removed by that time, but the stink of death seemed to remain. Shinri hadn't been able to spend long in those familiar hallways, now so eerily empty of life and motion, before despair for those who had been slain, many of whom she had known and cared for, drove her away. Drove her back to him, back into his lair and power. There was no escaping it, not yet. Not while he maintained such a careful watch over her. She was allowed to go where she willed within the palace. But if she tried to leave the Vaden section, she was quickly given an escort. Men watched every hallway. There were plenty of soldiers to spare, for the majority of Avon's time had been centered around bringing his entire army through the oath gates. Even if she were to escape the palace, large contingents of several hundred men stood guard at each ramp down to the city. And so Shinri forced herself to wait. With gritted teeth, she adopted an air of half-feigned subservience and endured the shame of knowing what it did to her. Lady Yasna's lessons were invaluable. The calming exercises helped Shinri contain her frustration, and the hours spent practicing her political face helped her keep the rebelliousness from her eyes. If Ava knew she wasn't completely suppressed, he gave no sign. Quite the opposite, for the sight of her bowing practically to the ground when he passed gave him obvious pleasure. She tried forcibly not to think of him. Unfortunately, other topics were equally discomforting. Somehow, it appeared that she had opened the oath gate. She had been the one who loosed Avon's soldiers upon her friends. She didn't know how her betrayal had occurred, but she felt guilty nonetheless. She couldn't remember the experience completely, the feelings and desires she'd felt during that moment when she'd touched the Oath Gate's control opal were gone now. Yet she could remember that she had felt something, that her thoughts had been expanded somehow. What had she done, and why had it worked? The Oath Gates were supposed to be impervious. Both sides had to be open before one could pass through. But somehow she had been able to bypass that rule. Why? What about her had made the Oath Gate react in such a way? Was it her personally? Or was there a specific set of circumstances that had demanded that someone like her touch the opal at that moment? One question was more disturbing than the rest. How had Avan known to use her in such a way? Again, she had no answers. Her current state was even more frustrating than being locked up in her room, not knowing who had captured her. She could walk about and ask questions, but no one had answers for her. No one but Avan. At least Yasna had escaped. Avan had attempted to suppress the news, but soldiers and servants talked. There was little he could do to stop the rumors, especially considering the dramatic nature of Yasna's disappearance. Shinri's handmaidens whispered about the large group of servants who had locked themselves in the palace cellars, apparently to make a last stand before being killed. When the soldiers broke down the doors, however, they'd found only empty rooms scattered with dust. It figured that Yasna would find a way to escape even an impossible situation. There was something about the woman that defied reality. It was as if she could pit her determination against fate and change the workings of the world through sheer force of will. The rumors, in typical Vaden fashion, dramatized the event to almost mystical proportions. 
speaking as if Yasna had managed to gather some near supernatural warriors to aid in her escape. Despite the embellishments, one thing was certain. Yasna was gone. The fact that Avan had sent work crews to tear down the cellar walls was enough to confirm that fact. Shinri froze. Another sound? This time it wasn't just her imagination. She could definitely hear the sound of voices coming from beyond the door between her bedchamber and Avan's. She sat rigid in her bed, jaw clinched, trying to suppress a shiver. Would he come? Would this be the night? The voices continued. One was undoubtedly Avan. The other was probably the strange shin man the king kept as his primary counselor, the man many of the servants feared for some undefined reason. The shin were a strange and arrogant people anyway, and this one seemed even more discomforting. His eyes haunted, his movements so unnaturally smooth, Shinri found him nearly as disturbing as the king himself. He's probably the one, she realized. The king's assassin. The Shin are frighteningly good warriors. Jarna's invasion proved that much. She could see the man's graceful danger slipping in and out of bedchambers, leaving only corpses behind. Someday soon he would probably take Shinri's own father. Or maybe even me. No, that was foolish. Avan had no reason to kill her. He assumed she was already his. One heir could die of disease. He would want more. If you run from him, he might decide he wants you dead. The thought was like the voice of a frightened child in her head. Shinri didn't want to think of such things. She was strong. Or at least, she thought of herself as being strong. That had always been her greatest resource. When she had resisted her father's will as a child, she had done it telling herself she was stronger than he, stronger than his manipulations, stronger than the whims of the other nobility. She had resisted the monks, then the stormkeepers with the same strength. Then there had been Yasna, the first one to show Shinri that there were different kinds of strength. Many assumed that Yasna had simply beaten Shinri into submission, forcing her to obey through a battle of wills. But that hadn't been it at all. That was the mistake her father and the others had all made. Yasna had offered Shinri something, the ability to control her surroundings, then had let Shinri decide for herself that she wanted it. It hadn't been a battle that had transformed Shinri but a simple factual conversation about the realities of noble life. Yasna had offered power, and Shinri had consented to learn. In the end, Shinri's acumen for what Yasna taught had led to internal battles of their own. However, the strength had always been there. Shinri was strong. That was why she had learned Yasna's lessons, and why she had applied them. Shinri couldn't let herself be manipulated by the court-goers and her own ignorance. Sitting quietly, shivering in the dark at the mere sound of a man's voice, Shinri finally had cause to question her perceptions of strength. Was it weak to fear the creature who had done such terrible things to her? Was it timid to worry that she wasn't the determined, capable person she had always assumed? Was it wrong? to fear that face of his, that cold, inhuman expression, one made all the more horrific by her memories. She could still see those eyes looming above her during the moment of passion, those horrible eyes that had revealed to her the monstrosity that had become her husband. This was the creature from which she feared to flee. Though she had made her decision to escape, she couldn't stop the childlike whispers of fright from within. He had proven that he was not a man to be defied. What would he do when he discovered that she had run? Would he send the Shin assassin to kill her? Would she awake one night to find those graceful hands at her throat? Or would it be something even worse? Something she hesitated to imagine. A humiliating, even crippling retribution. 
something that would break the strength she thought she retained, leaving her a docile and cringing husk. As the voices continued, Shinri's imagination devised ten sets of tortures the demented man could force upon her. These were the things that awaited her if she invoked Avon's ire. I'll just have to make sure I'm not recaptured, she thought, with a determination that she wished were completely unfeigned. Chapter 47 Taln 9 There, Taln said, pointing in the evening light. Lights sparkled in the distance. Kemnar stopped beside him, squinting in the darkness. I don't see anything, he said. Still too distant, then, for normal eyes, Tom thought. Let's move up a little farther, he suggested. He had lived so long as a herald that he often forgot what it was like to have the senses of a regular man. Kemnar nodded, and the two continued to pick their way across the stony ground, scouting ahead of the refugee group. A few moments later, Kemnar paused. Well, leave me in the rain and take my cloak, he mumbled in surprise. There is a town up there. It's about time. Does it help determine where we are? Kemnar cocked his head thoughtfully. It will once I know which one it is. It looks fairly big, at least sixth city size. Danagel? Marcabe, perhaps? He shook his head. I've spent too little time on this side of the kingdom, Tom. We'll have to get a little closer. It's probably Danagel, but I didn't think we were that far east. Tom nodded, trusting Kemnar's judgment. Tom himself was practically useless at pathfinding. While Kolinar and a couple of older cities remained where they once had, the general landscape of the kingdom had changed greatly in the nine hundred years he had been gone. He had only been able to explain the general location of the mountain exit, and they had been forced to strike out uncertainly. Only finding a town or major intersection would tell them exactly where they were. Kemnar led the way. As they had traveled, Tom had come to trust his original impression of the man. Kemnar was competent, but humble, curious, but unassuming. He seemed to be completely unconcerned with rank or privilege, an odd quality in a nobleman. In fact, he had proven strangely more comfortable with the simple people of the troop, despite his lordly heritage. To a herald still uncomfortable with the devotion he was paid, Kemnar's attitudes were unspokenly familiar. The town lights were still in the distance when Kemnar spoke quietly, a slight smile on his lips. Lady Yasna's going to be displeased when she finds out we investigated without going back to report first. You don't seem all that concerned about her displeasure, Tal noted. Kemnar's smile widened. If we went back, she'd just order us to visit the town anyway. This saves time. Tal raised an eyebrow, walking around a particularly large rock bud. The lady certainly is fond of controlling her surroundings, and the people in them. Kemnar chuckled, but Tom hadn't intended the comment lightly. During his travels the last week, he had often questioned the oath of obedience he had given Yasna. Why had he agreed to such a thing? It wasn't that Tom chafed at letting another lead. In fact, he usually preferred to leave decision-making to one of the other Elin. Yasna, however, knew so little of what was really happening in the world. She was only concerned with getting word of the invasion to her brother. In addition, her methods were annoying. While she wasn't a tyrant with her power, she also seemed incapable of trusting a man to do his duty properly. She had to be involved in every detail of their work and had to control practically every decision they made. Only two things kept him from leaving to seek the holy city on his own. Foremost was the peaceful knowledge of his brethren's location. Before, he had felt lost and uncertain, worried that something had happened, and that he was alone to protect mankind. Now that he knew that the other heralds had gathered, 
His tension relaxed, and the fires of defeat retreated. Jezrian, Rael, Nail, Chanaral, Ishar, these were men far wiser than himself. Though his own efforts this return had been ineffectual, the others would have matters in hand. He could afford a slight diversion, even suffer Yasna's commands, if it would build friendship and indebtedness with the leaders of Alethkar. When he joined the other Elin, he would be able to deliver that much at least. His second reason for staying was a matter of honor. He felt a responsibility to the people he had helped rescue. The palace servants looked up to him. He could feel their growing respect. And while their devotion made him uncomfortable, he knew that he should encourage it. These ones would spread knowledge of the return and prepare the common people of Alethkar. He would not betray their budding dependence on him by leaving them to the desolation of summer highlands. You know, Kemnar said after a few moments of walking, she's not really as bad as you think. Yosna? Talon asked. Kemnar nodded. She's a bit overbearing, I agree, but at least she cares. That's more than I can say for most of the nobility in Alethkar. Lady Yasna, she just tries a little too hard, I think. She is fortunate to have a man such as yourself following her, Tull noted. Kemnar chuckled wryly. Not for much longer, it appears. He tapped the oversized pack on his back. Duffel wrapped with two poles sticking out the side, it ostensibly held a tent. The two shard blades within were too obvious to carry in the open, yet neither man would consider leaving them behind. The pack was awkward and a little strange, but it was the only alternative. She says that since I'm a shard bearer, I'm too high a rank to be a common bodyguard. I should never have accepted the blasted thing. Now that I have a blade, everyone's going to expect me to start acting respectable. Talon shrugged, thinking of his own blade. Since they had no opals, both weapons had begun to revert to blanks, and their length had shortened slightly. Talon wasn't accustomed to the process. He had never really been forced to bond a blade before. It bothered him how easily Meridas had bonded glifting, erasing the familiar patterns that had lined its blade for millennia. Instead of the elegant efficiency of Tuln's touch, it had become the stunted, straight-backed weapon Meridas seemed to prefer. Chanaral had hypothesized that the Elin blades, if adulterated by an imperfect opal, would act the same way as the imitation blades crafted by Epic Kingdom weaponsmiths. He had been right. Meridas had been able to bond Talon's blade as if it were nothing special. Losing his blade to such a man, it felt like an invasion to Talon, a perversion. Talon shook his head, glancing at Kemnar's pack. At least he had a blade. It was no glifting, but it would have to do, for now. In truth, human-crafted shard blades shouldn't even exist. Though the legends claimed otherwise, Tuln's brethren had never intended mankind to have access to blades. Ishar claimed it was one of the great mysteries of time that men, so innocent and unskilled in the three arts, had managed to craft such impressive imitations of the weapons they had seen their heralds wielding. Shalessa had been the one who spread the rumors that the weapons had indeed been gifts of the heralds, granting them some measure of control over the development. Still, Talm doubted that men understood the meaning of the blades they wielded. To them, the weapons were simply another tool, a powerful one, true, but still just a tool. They saw a shard blade as a trophy to possess and exploit, not a chip from one's very soul, a link to both Nael and Lahel. None of the heralds took the opportunity to explain the difference. It was bad enough that mankind had the weapons. Almighty protect the world if they ever found out the true power locked within those blades. She's fond of you, you know, Kemnar said. Talon cocked an eyebrow. Kemnar was still on the topic of Lady Yasna. I doubt that, he replied. More frustrated than fond, I would say. Kemnar shook his head. She likes people who are a bit odd. 
They interest her. She could have chosen practically any Aleth nobleman of lesser rank to lead her guard. She could have had brilliant duelists, keen strategists, or could have at least made clever alliances through her choices. Instead, she picked me and... Nelshenden. He paused quietly for a moment when he said his friend's name. During the last week, Tuln had pried from Kemnar the true events surrounding Elokar's departure. The truth had only given Tuln one more reason to some day find a way to duel Meridas. Anyway, Kemnar said, she chose us. We were hardly the finest swordsmen in Alethkar, and our political connections. Well, let's just say that in my case, she'd been politically better off before she chose me. I have something of a reputation in court. Nelshenden wasn't much better. A man as simply honest as himself earns a measure of respect from his peers, but Nelshenden was no Dalinar. He didn't have mighty deeds or a firm commanding air to back up his ideals. Most court members found him self-righteous and disapproving. In a way, he was even more excluded from their ranks than myself. And yet we were the two men Lady Yasna chose to lead her soldiers. Despite all her manipulations at court, when it came down to her own guards, she chose men she could trust. He paused, eyeing Tuln. And I think she trusts you. Or at least she would if... If I weren't insane, Tuln said. Kemnar laughed, clapping Tuln on the shoulder. None of us are perfect, Tuln. They fell silent as they walked. Ahead, the city was getting closer in the night. Hopefully they would arrive before the taverns began to close. Kemnar walked quietly at Tuln's side, alert and watchful despite his conversational attitude. This was a man accustomed to slinking through darkness and watching for foes, another attribute Tuln would not have thought to discover in a Kanaran nobleman. The town was relatively large for an outlying non-late village. Tuln suspected it augmented income, and therefore population, by trading across the Remak border a short distance away. Eventually, the two men passed through hillsides free of rock buds and other vegetation, though their feet scuffed the remnants of inava stalks. The bulbous grain-providing plants would have been harvested in preparation for the coming midsummer high storm. As they drew closer to the city, Tuln was comforted to see that they weren't too late. At least a half ten set taverns shone brightly across the city. Architecture appeared to have changed little in the centuries he had been gone. Simple stone dwellings were the norm. Here, away from the prettiness of Rel Aram, many of the buildings had been allowed to grow over with the minerals dropped by high storm rains. Over the years, countless winters, filled with almost unceasing rains, had caked the buildings with sheens of rock not unlike those created from drippings inside caves. The transformation made the structures look less like man-made creations and more like things that seemed to have grown up as natural hills. Stalactites dripped from overhangs, and more ancient structures almost resembled melted piles of wax. Kemnar smiled, pausing at the base of a hill a short distance from town, standing so his body would not be silhouetted against the night sky. My father is lord of a city not unlike this, he noted, on the southeast corner of the kingdom. Despite the layout of the buildings, this could have been the very place I grew up. Tull nodded. What are the current customs regarding travelers? Will anyone note our visit as irregular? Oh, they'll note it, Kemnar said. Strangers are always noticed, my friend. But will it be unusual? No, not likely. Most communities like this depend on trade to survive. They'll need the leathers and metals their parent city produces with its awakeners. The war will make people edgy, but I doubt travel will cease. Wandering duelists, monks, and craftsmen will still pass through. Families looking for a new city to settle will often visit. The way of kings promises them right of travel. What's our story, then? Taln asked. Kemnar paused for a moment, looking over their outfits. 
A pair of men-at-arms, he decided. Traveling back to our lord's city after performing a task. Not noblemen, but moderately high-ranking peasants. Third citizens. You have that knife you took off the dead nobleman? Of course, Tone said, revealing the long-bladed knife. Make sure to display it prominently. It's the sort of thing a high citizen would wear. It's short enough to be considered still a knife, but long enough to almost be a sword. We'll be expected to have spears, or more likely axes, but could have left those behind with our packmen. Our story is that we stop for refreshment and news, but intend to press on through the night and next day before we stop for the bellow. Our home city is Spire Mount. Our master, Fourth Lord Cranshell. Our task is no one's business. Tull nodded. And, Kenmore added hesitantly, you might want to let me do most of the talking. That accent of yours will be fairly recognizable here close to the border. We could explain it away, but I'd rather not draw attention. Tone frowned, but nodded again. Despite the man's friendliness, Kemnar obviously regarded Tone as Yasna did, a lost wanderer from Remak, addled in the head. Yasna had yet to commit to a final course for the refugee group, but Tone was growing increasingly eager to travel through the western land to the holy city. Beyond searching out his brethren, this would let him see this area that everyone assumed was his home. The city turned out to be Markabe, a sixth city, tributed to Ralankon. They were admitted through the city gates on Kemnar's story. Though the hour was late, the taverns were still quite busy. Kemnar explained that because the harvest was in, there would be little for the town's men to do the next day, and no reason for them to rise early. In addition, the town inns would be full of people who had come to the city to seek shelter from the bellow. Taln and Kemnar walked leisurely through the town, and Taln noticed not a few city guards watching at intersections, keeping a wary eye on both townsfolk and newcomers. The city even had a monastery, though it was too dark and too distant to tell which order practiced within. Kemnar picked a tavern with moderate occupancy. It was a well-kept but out-of-the-way place that lay several streets off of the main thoroughfare. Tone wasn't certain how Kemnar knew where to find it, yet the nobleman seemed to have little trouble. He simply glanced at where the other main taverns were and then struck off the central thoroughfare and walked directly toward his chosen location. The tavern was an older building, its sides slick with cromstone. At first glance, its outside appeared to have been abandoned to the elements, but on closer examination, Tuln noted the uniformity of the stalactites, and how the cromstone curled inward around the windows, allowing for unobstructed sunlight. The doorway was also well maintained. Inside, there was a surprising amount of wood furniture. Apparently, the Aleth managed to maintain a stable awakening economy even far from their capital. With the right awakeners placed beside working quarries, the cost of emeralds could be offset by the ease of transporting wood instead of stone. The result was a substance that, while rare in natural occurrence, was nearly as cheap as good building stone. The structure's layout was unfamiliar to Tone. Instead of traditional Canaran pillars, the tavern had been built with enormous wooden support beams in the ceiling, allowing for a more open atmosphere. A large stone serving bar ran down the exact center of the room with an opening down the middle for the barkeep to serve drinks. Men sat upon stools on both sides, talking amongst themselves. Nearly all the lanterns in the room burned along this central bar, and there were more secluded, darkened tables lining the walls. Kemnar shunned these, making directly for a pair of stools at the bar. He set down their pack, pulled out a couple of glazed sapphire chips to buy drinks, and waved for Tuln to sit beside him. Tuln eased into the seat, mindful to keep his tongue as the barkeep brought their drinks. The mugs were metal, though they had obviously been crafted from clay first, then awakened. 
The barkeep himself was a short man, with alith coloring. Despite his size, he had a wiry build and a no-nonsense glare that reminded one to be mindful of causing trouble in his bar. None of the patrons seemed inclined to disobey. There was an air of hesitant relaxation about them. As Tone listened, he was able to pick out ten sets of conversations, his herald's mind instantly dividing the voices from one another and following the different discussions. The men were relieved that the harvest had come in well. Insects had been found inside the first polyps of Inava harvested, the grain eaten or spoiled from water leakage. Fortunately, the vermin hadn't gone far, and the general harvest had been a success. The monastery, Order of Ishar, interestingly enough, had planned a feast in honor of their good fortune, and it was to take place on the day after the bellow. Following the feast, the people would repair their city from the high storm, then begin preparations for the summer planting, which had to be ready twenty days after the bellow, the day when normal high storms began again. For now, however, there was rest. The harvest had finished early, leaving the men with nearly two weeks of freedom before the bellow. Most had busied themselves with common tasks put off until such a time yet there had been plenty of opportunity for leisure. At first the men had been worried that a conscription call would be made for the king's army, as had happened several times during the Prelir War. This time, however, it appeared that Elokar intended to be finished before conscription could be gathered, and for that the men were relieved. Anyone with adventurous inclinations had already been taken— and the last few calls for soldiers had required their local lord to begin choosing young men, and sometimes older ones, regardless of their desire. Men had stopped going to the monastery for weapons training. Remote monasteries such as theirs trained in all of the arts, regardless of their order, for fear that such would single them out for military duty. Tone took this little tidbit in with a bitter frown. His brethren had instituted citizen arms training during the Epic Kingdom's era to ensure that everyone would be able to defend themselves against the Hothen. Unfortunately, the palace servants' performance during the Vaden invasion proved that many had grown lax in their training. Kemnar did more than just listen. Soon after they settled into their places, he began grumbling about his duties, his noble captain, and the lengths he was required to travel. His dissatisfaction with his superiors prompted general agreement from those around him, and soon he had a small group of confidants grumbling with him. The grumbles turned to smiles as Kemnar offered to spend a few of his lord's chips to buy his new comrades a mug or two of Inava beer. Within a short time Kemnar was chatting with the men as if they were childhood buddies— skillfully probing for information about current events. Tone was impressed at Kemnar's tact. The townsmen soon revealed that they were annoyed by the number of strangers in town this time of year. They didn't even pause to think that they were speaking with one such, and that the bars along the main strip had raised their prices to capitalize on the influx. The damp stone, their own bar, appeared to be the favored spot for the common men, and was rarely visited by the passing rabble. The men had no news from Ral Aram. Through a series of careful questions, Kemnar was able to gather that no one had come through town recently asking about travelers, and there was no word in the underground about a group such as Yasna's. That fact was comforting, though Tuln had hoped that somehow the fall of the first capital would be known. Either the invaders had succeeded in taking the town quietly, or word simply hadn't reached this corner of the kingdom yet. Of the war at Crossguard, the men knew little of substance. Apparently this section of the kingdom was loyal to the king, and they spoke of Jezenrosh with spiteful voices. Their own city lord rode with the king, as did his sons, and the townsmen spoke of this fact with pride though Tuln doubted Elokar had any care for attributing Sixth Lord or his offspring. Several men claimed to have heard that the siege had begun, a few guessed it already over, but the majority professed ignorance. Elokar was moving quickly, 
and they had heard little from their sons or friends in the army. They all expected it would be a quick, easy battle. After all, the king had taken his wrath to Prala, running down the traitor who had killed his father. After that, dealing with a pest such as Jezenrosh would be simple. Kemnar was winding down the evening's discussions by asking after any horses that might be for sale when the atmosphere changed. Talm perked up, though no one else in the tavern seemed to notice it. Something had happened. Something subtle, something even he couldn't pick out. His senses were such that his unconscious mind often discerned trouble long before it actually arrived. He sat tensely, hand resting on Kenmar's pack, fingers inching toward the shard blade hilt within, as a newcomer entered the bar. Tone tracked the young man, noting his excitement, his slightly drunken posture, and his quick searching eyes. This was a man with news. Tone elbowed Kemnar, nodding toward the newcomer. He needn't have bothered. When the young man spoke, his voice was loud enough for the entire bar to hear. A nobleman in the city, he exclaimed to his friends at the other end of the bar, high of rank with a shard blade. They say he's come with the king's sister herself. Kemnar and Tal exchanged a glance and were out the door a heartbeat later. A crowd had gathered near an inn on the main thoroughfare. This building was one of the few in the city kept clean of cromstone, and it stood more like a structure from Rel Aram or Kolinar, with strong stone sides and pillars at the front. A surprising number of townspeople had gathered, many of them looking as if they had been roused from sleep, and they stood whispering to themselves, trying to press up against the inn's door or windows for a look. Tuln and Kemnar paused at the outer rim, ineffectually trying to push their way through the mass of bodies. With a sigh, Tal nodded to Kemnar, and they removed their shard blades from the pack. Tal handed Kemnar's weapon to him, then hefted his own weapon, exposing the distinctive silvery metal and pommel which still bore the dark black opal of its previous owner. It only took the townspeople a few moments to notice them, and suddenly the crowd's focus changed directions. The people parted with alarm, people bowing with shocked or excited expressions. Tom pushed through the front door and saw precisely what he had expected and dreaded. This inn was lavish compared to the tavern they had left, with rugs on the floor, ornamented pillars, and even some marble coatings on a few surfaces. Most of the furniture in the common room had been cleared, making room at the center for two wooden tables, one for the men, one for the women. A haughty-faced Meridas sat at the head of the men's table, a lavish meal being laid out before him. Yasna sat at the other table with her ladies-in-waiting. She seemed less pleased than Meridas, though her face was always difficult to read. So much for stealth, Tuln muttered. As he stepped inside, he noted that the rest of the refugees were eating a short distance away in a separate, larger dining hall. Kemnar snorted in agreement, but said nothing. Meridas smiled as soon as he saw Tuln. Ah, oh, madman, he said. And the good lord Kemnar. I had hoped you would wait until dinner was finished to return, as do not spoil the taste— but I suppose we can find a place for you somewhere? Tuln ignored him, stalking through the room to Yasna's table. He stood beside her, folding his arms expectantly. You should have come to report as soon as you saw the city, Tuln, she said, stabbing a piece of glazed meat with a small spear-like fork. We wondered what happened to you and sent other scouts. Tuln raised an eyebrow. Her words were scolding, but they lacked her usual sting. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't realize you would be foolish enough to reveal yourself by coming inside to look for us. Yasna shot him a veiled glare at that one. We had to come in some time, she said. We need supplies. Kemnar and I could have gathered them without exposing ourselves to our pursuers. And what of those? Yasna said, waving toward the refugees in the other room. 
You knew we needed to drop them off. How did you expect to do that without exposing ourselves to our pursuers? Or did you somehow expect us to travel quickly to Kolinar while carrying with us the wounded and the weak? Tom gritted his teeth in frustration. Do not reveal our destination, he hissed, glancing back at the peasants watching outside. Do you want the invaders to know all of our plans? Yasna paused, flushing slightly. Beside them, however, Maradas laughed openly. You are a fool, madman, though I suppose it is too much to ask anything else of you. There is no proof of these pursuers you mention other than your own word, which we already know to be often delusional. Did you really think we would simply pass this town by quiet as storm shades? As Lady Yasna noted, we have to rid ourselves of excess weight. Besides, we must send messengers to His Majesty and Lord Dalinar. You expected us to do such things without inspiring gossip from messengers' family and friends? Better we come in openly so that we might prevent rumors. Information is our ally, not that of our enemy. Ton ground his teeth. Unfortunately, the foppish man spoke some measure of truth. It was highly unlikely that they could have passed Markabe without revealing themselves. Later villages they could avoid with stealth, but not this first one. They would simply have to hope that their pursuers were slow to find their trail. It really is for the best, Tan, Yasna informed. Maradas was right this time. We needed to come in. Besides, without the authority of the crown, we wouldn't have the necessary funds to do as we need. Tan glanced down, realizing for the first time that their group hardly had the money to pay for such extravagant meals, let alone horses, which were apparently still extremely rare in Kanaran Roshar. They will loan us gems against the king's name, Tan asked. Yasna nodded. Markabe is loyal to my brother and Meridas is known here. He was a merchant until just recently, and this was one of his main trade stops. We can borrow from the Lord's own stewards. Probably not much, mind you, but enough to get us by. Tan sighed, seating himself at an open stool beside Yasna, the move causing snickers from Meridas's table. Tan ignored them, frowning at his own foolishness. He should have returned rather than visiting the city. He had left Yasna open to Meridas's manipulation. Perhaps revealing themselves was necessary, but certainly this level of pomp was excessive. Pout if you must, madman, Meridas noted, as if he had known what Tan was thinking. But I, for one, never planned to give up this last opportunity for comfort— Lady Osna spent the last two weeks traipsing through tunnels and across stormlands. You don't think she deserved a warm meal and a night of rest after such? Tan groaned inwardly, wondering how much Meridas was going to reveal of their secret flight. Probably everything. By the morning, the entire story of their escape would be known to the town. Well, perhaps that is a good thing, Tan told himself. He eyed Meridas. The man was such a pompous fool, yet there was a hidden cleverness to him. Meridas's comment about information had been lucid. Secrecy was the agent of the invaders. If even rumors reached King Elokar, it would serve as something of a warning. And the surest way to spread rumors was through drama. A midnight entry followed by an expensive and highly visible meal and accompanied by a daring tale of escape— it was just the sort of news that would move quickly and eagerly, especially once men left the village following the bellow. If Yasna's group had to expose themselves to the city, perhaps it was better that they did so with flair, using the situation to their advantage. Meridas did not reveal whether he was making such a calculated and daring move, or if he simply wanted a warm meal. He caught Tan's studying eye and smiled. One thing was certain. Here in the city, Meridas was once again in his element. Tan would not get the better of him while within its borders. 
Tom sighed, giving in to Kemnar's prompting and joining the men's table where he allowed himself to be fed before the gawking townspeople. Reasons aside, it had happened. They were in the city, exposed. The best thing to do was to make use of the conveniences, then get out as quickly as possible. Chapter 48 Marin 11 A column of smoke twisted toward the dwelling, a black streak that faded to translucence barely visible in the starlight. Marin stood, stepping away from their meager fire, a fire whose smoke had masked the wind's ominous scent, a scent familiar but unwelcome, burning flesh. I can smell the burning stations, Marin said, scanning the darkness for other columns of smoke. The battlefield is close. Renarin didn't respond. Marin turned back, glancing through the embers of smoldering rockbud shells. Renarin crouched in the ruddy light, one hand clutching his onyx sphere, the other pinching a worn bit of charcoal between two talon-like fingers as he scribbled on the stone beside their campfire. The light barely illuminated his figure, leaving his face dark, faintly outlined in red. Renarin? Marin prodded. There was a long pause, then Renarin looked up, his movements slow, as if impeded by a great weight of stone. He blinked. Yes? Marin pointed toward the sky. I just noticed those smoke trails. They're probably from burning stations. Renarin blinked, then slowly stood, eyes becoming more alert. It's like he has to pull himself away from somewhere else, Marin thought, like he has to rejoin this world before he can interact. They're close, Renarin said in a monotone voice, moving over to stand beside Marin. Marin nodded. We stopped too early. We could have made it tonight after all. Renarin stood for a moment, looking up into the night sky, the last waves of dusk creeping away in the west. You want to go on? he finally asked. Yes, Marin said eagerly. Probably better to go at night anyway. We'll need to sneak past the king's lines and get into Jessenrosh's camp. All right, Renarin said, though he turned his eyes toward the campfire as he spoke, staring down at the ground toward his strange notations. Marin hurriedly gathered their supplies and repacked the saddlebags. Renarin watched the ground until Marin stamped out the embers, stealing the light. We should probably lead the horses in the darkness, Renarin said, accepting his beast's reins from Marin. All right, Marin said, leading the way to the south toward the lines of smoke. Fortunately, Renarin followed, trailing along behind like a wisp from their now-dead fire. You shouldn't be so worried about him, Marin told himself. Everyone says that Renarin is strange, and you haven't really known him that long. Maybe this kind of distraction is actually normal for him. Better to worry about more pertinent problems, like exactly how they were going to find Arador. Marin had mentioned sneaking past the king's lines and entering Jezenrosh's camp but he doubted it would be that simple. For one thing, there was a good chance that Jezenrosh had chosen to remain besieged in his city rather than face Elokar in the open. If that were the case, Marin wasn't sure how they were going to get past the city walls. What would Marin and Renarin do if confronted by scouts or sentries? And, assuming they did find Arador, how were they going to persuade him to return? Ardor hadn't been willing to listen to such arguments on the day he left Kolinar. What made Marin think this time would be different? He expected us to come, Marin thought. He left instructions regarding us. He thought we might come and help him, come fight with him. And he probably had a right to expect it of them. Leaving Kolinar had been an act of disobedience itself. What more would it hurt by joining Ardor in his fight? Could Lord Dalinar really blame Marin if he were acting alongside the man's own sons? The hike took longer than it might have during the day, but it still only took them about an hour to reach Crossguard. Marin kept careful but untrained watch for any scouts or sentries, knowing with a sort of resigned gloom that he probably wouldn't see them before he himself was spotted. 
Strangely, however, he didn't see anything, nor was he stopped by oncoming soldiers. In fact, Marin rounded a hillside and practically stumbled into the camp itself. Marin quickly ducked back into the shadows, waving Renarin to follow. The sky was lit by fires and torches, but Marin had incorrectly judged the light's proximity. Leave the horses, Marin whispered, bending down to tie his reins to a rockbud polyp. Then he waved Renarin to follow as he scuttled up the hillside. The camp below was arranged in a familiar fashion. Those tents and neat blocks had been the patterns of Marin's life for a very long time. There were far more burning stations than he had expected, and the scent of smoke was strong in the air. The city of Crossguard was a dark block in the near distance, more like a large keep than a proper city. Renarin shuffled beside him. This is wrong, Marin, he whispered. Too much fire. There was a lot of death this day, Marin said with a bitter taste in his mouth. No, Renarin said. Not just that. Those are the fires of death, but also of victory. This war is over. We are too late. That can't be, Marin said. Look, lights burn atop the city wall, and the keep looks like it's occupied. There's too much... Marin trailed off as Renarin pointed toward the city. At first, Marin couldn't make out the reason for the gesture, but slowly his eyes discerned shapes half hidden in the darkness. He could see through the wall in one entire section, could see the twinkling of lights beyond. An enormous chunk of the wall was simply missing. Awakeners, Renarin whispered. Marin closed his mouth. Renarin's hushed word hanging like a dread curse. Never during the entire Prala War had the king used his Awakeners in battle. Lord Dalinar would have forbidden it, but now that restriction was gone. Even still, to use Awakeners against his own kinsmen. Arador, Marin said, standing. We have to find him. Renarin reached out, grabbing a hold of the edge of Marin's cloak. We're too late, Marin, he whispered. Marin pulled the cloak free. Wait here, he said. I'm just going to go look around a bit. I have to find out what happened to Arador. If the king has him in captivity, Lord Dalinar needs to know. Marin continued down the side of the hill. A part of him realized that he wasn't thinking rationally, that he didn't want to consider the implication of Renarin's statement. But what was he supposed to do? Come all this way, then turn around and face Lord Dalinar's disappointment without even a word of news about his son and heir? As Marin strode forward in the night, he heard Renarin scramble up behind him. Put up your hood, Renarin said. Our cloaks are colin blue, and you have a shard blade. If we stay away from the main camp, maybe no one will notice that we bear my father's glyph. Marin nodded, doing as suggested. He rested his shard blade on his shoulder, then continued forward in the night, walking directly toward the gap in the city wall. Men in Elokar's army might recognize him, but the townspeople of Crossguard wouldn't, Perhaps some of them could give news, if they're not all cowering in their storm cellars. In fact, King Elokar probably declared a curfew. That's what he did in all the Pralin cities we captured. What am I doing? This is foolish. But he'd been foolish twice before. He'd jumped to attack a shardbearer while the rest of his squad scattered, grabbing a hold of an armored man and pulling him from his mount. He stood beside Arador to fight two experienced duelists with superior equipment. Both times bravery had served him well. The few soldiers they passed bowed and moved quickly away, seeing the blade but not the shadowed faces. Marin approached the crossguard walls, each step seeming to take him into a deeper state of numbness. Chunks of rock lay scattered across the ground around the gap in the wall. The Awakeners had only needed to destroy the foundations, and the section of stone had collapsed. The broken hole in the wall approached with the looming despair of a city shattered, defeated, conquered. Two lines of torches stood just inside the gap, running corridor-like into the city. As Marin drew closer, he realized that there was something standing in between each pair of torches, something vaguely illuminated by their light something thin. Marin, let's turn back, Renarin encouraged. His voice seemed distant, removed. Marin stepped up to the gap in the wall. 
It was at least a hundred feet across. The torches were closer now, and he walked toward the line closest to him. It was odd to find no sentries by the city wall. Perhaps Elokar didn't see anything else to fear from Crossguard. There was some movement inside the city, mostly what looked like guard patrols in the streets. Marin had been right. There would be no interviewing city occupants this night. However, Marin's interest no longer lay in the townspeople. He walked up to the lines of torches, toward the objects they guarded. Marin, Renarin said. Marin ignored him, striding right up to the first pair of torches, where he found Arador waiting for him. The heir's decapitated head was strangely recognizable. For some reason that didn't seem right. This gruesome thing stuck to a spear shouldn't have been so familiar, shouldn't have reminded Marin of laughter and camaraderie. He should have seen only death in it, not a strong reminder of the man who had befriended and guided him. Marin turned back toward Renarin. The boy stood with sorrow, his torch-lit features hauntingly similar to the ones atop the spear. He's dead, Marin, Renarin whispered. We couldn't have changed that. We were too far away, and we left too late. Marin turned back to Arador. This isn't the way it was supposed to be, Arador, he said. I came to get you, to take you back. Marin, Renarin said with a quiet urgency, those guards have noticed us. We should go. Marin stared into Arador's dark, dead eyes. Why? Why wasn't I in time? Where is the Almighty now? He helped me save the king's life twice only so that very man could kill Arador? Where is the justice in that? Marin, Renarin said with further urgency. Marin allowed the boy to pull him away from the line of torches and its grisly faces. As the faces fell into darkness, however, the questions they asked didn't leave Marin alone. It was fortuitous that they managed to reach their horses without incident, but Marin barely noticed. His body did its duty, carrying him forward as they untied their horses and escaped out into the night, heading west toward Kolinar for lack of anything else to do. They rode silently. Arador can't be dead. That thing atop the spirit wasn't him. Marin didn't want to think. He just wanted to walk in the darkness. What was the use of Bajardin and Shanaris, the arguments and nobility, if they didn't protect the men who followed them? Neither man spoke complaint as they trudged eastward, riding impassively for hours. Marin wanted to be far away from that place, for he knew when he finally did lay down to sleep, he would see dead eyes watching him, accusatory in his sleep. He was actually surprised when a shadow appeared before him, and he realized a faint light was shining on the horizon behind him. Had they really walked that long? A voice suddenly snapped in the air. The figures were upon them like a sudden storm, pulling Marin to the ground and ripping his shard blade from his fingers. He cried out as something heavy pressed against his back, holding him down. The voice sounded again, speaking in a language Marin didn't understand. Rough hands grabbed Marin, hauling him to his feet. Dazed, he saw Renarin undergoing similar treatment a short distance away. A group of soldiers in Aleth Blue surrounded them, watching with wary eyes. The king's soldiers. Marin shook his head, trying to dispel his stupor. Had they really been tracked all this time? Followed by, Where is the Lady Colin? the voice demanded, speaking Aleth with a strange accent. The speaker was the only one who didn't wear blue, but was instead dressed in simple brown clothing of little note. His face, however, was odd. His eyes were wide, a little too big, like those of a child, and his skin had a bleached paleness to it. Where is the Lady Colin? the man repeated. His voice was calm, but there was a danger to it an implication that his was a question best answered as quickly and as truthfully as possible. Lady Yasna? Marin said with true confusion. What are you talking about? The strange man frowned slightly. 
He stepped forward, moving with an almost inhuman litheness, slinking like a passing breeze and not a creature of flesh. He studied Marin for a moment, then turned to Renarin. I recognize you, the strange man said in his lightly accented voice. The son of Dalinar Colin. Renarin hung limply in his captor's arms. The stranger watched them both for a moment. These are not the ones we are looking for, he finally said. But the king may desire to speak with them. Regardless, they cannot be released now. Bind them and search them for weapons. Their captors moved to comply, quickly binding Marin's arms. He didn't struggle until he saw one of the men holding his shard blade. The man raised a rock toward the pommel. No! Marin yelled, suddenly frantic. His hundred days were nearly up. He almost had the blade bound. If he lost it now— One of the soldiers cuffed Marin neatly on the side of the head, dazing him. The other man let the rock fall, knocking the nearly blackened opal free from its bindings. Marin watched with despair as the gemstone fell to the stones, discarded as useless. Marin watched with stupefaction, his head throbbing from the blow. It took a sudden motion from the side to make him focus again. Renarin was free. The boy jumped away from the soldiers, clutching something protectively in his fingers, his onyx sphere. He turned to dash away, but one of the soldiers tackled him, throwing him to the ground. The sphere flew free from protective fingers, smashing to the ground a short distance from Marin. The sphere shattered as stone met stone, scattering dark chips into the air. Renarin cried out in despair, scrambling forward, then falling to the ground as one of the soldiers grabbed his foot. Marin yanked against his surprised captor's grip, free for a sudden and marvelous moment. Then he was there, the Shin Man, moving like flowing water. He grabbed Marin by the neck and threw him down with a smooth spin of the body. Arms still tied, Marin hit the ground hard, and blackness took him. Chapter 49 Yasna, 11 I'm sorry, my lady, but there just aren't any horses to be found. Yasna frowned. Twentieth Lord Nivedalesh, Lord Ivanol's steward, was an aging man who appeared to have seen some battle in his younger days, for his face bore a massive scar that left part of his scalp hairless. If he noticed the oddity of being questioned by a woman, rather than Meridas, he made no outward display. Not even one? Yasna prodded. The innkeeper had provided one of his back sleeping chambers to her for use as an audience hall. The decorations were of a faux lavishness, with just enough sea silk, marble, and expensive woods to give hints of richness. The room was uncomfortably hot. Yasna had accustomed herself to life in Ral Aram, and the city's elevation had kept its temperatures chill, even during the summer. It had been some time since Yasna had been forced to spend the searing out in the countryside. Her high-backed chair, at least, was comfortable, and the local maids had cleaned and perfumed her dress, removing most of the stains. They couldn't do anything about the tattered edges or ripped side, but at least it was a little more presentable. She sat, keeping her posture ladylike, despite the heat, as the steward spoke. I'm sorry, my lady, the man said. But Lord Ivanol was commanded to collect every horse the town could provide. King Elokar needed them to march against the fallen portion of Crossguard. We sent every beast in the stable, though that was in truth a small number. We are not a rich town, my lady, and horses are a great expense. Even my lord himself kept only six. Yasna kept her face calm, but inside she seethed at her lack of options. She could, of course, continue on to another town and ask for mounts there. However, she had an unsettling feeling that if Ivanol had been commanded to send for all his horses— the other lords in this area would have been given the same order. Southwestern Alethkar was one of Elokar's main bastions of support. She would have to travel halfway to Kolinar itself 
before she found one of Dalinar's tribute cities, which would have remained neutral at their lord's command. Her feet ached at the thought of traveling so far without horses. After just a week's travel, she felt sore and fatigued, and this week had been done at a slow pace to accommodate the wounded and elderly. She had blisters in a ten set of places, and though a pretty new set of slippers hid the bottoms of her feet, she could feel the raw flesh throbbing beneath. She gritted her teeth against the pains. Others had endured similar problems without complaint, and so would she. Fortunately, she probably wouldn't have to do much more walking herself. Have the messengers been sent? she asked. The steward nodded. Yes, my lady. Four of our fastest lads, two sent running to Kolinar, two sent to the king's army, all four by different routes. Yasna nodded, trying not to feel guilt for the way she used these people. She had explained the danger to them, but sensed that they didn't realize just how great a threat the invaders presented. The people assumed that King Elokar, whose victories in Prala had come with such relative ease, would similarly have little problem driving the Vaden invaders from Alice Stone. They didn't understand the army's fatigue, the casualties they had incurred by fighting in Prala, and the morale losses they would suffer by being forced to fight their kinsmen in Crossguard. Vadenar would not be under-equipped, as Prelir had been. Its soldiers would be well-trained, better warriors even than their Aleth counterparts. Vadenar hosted the finest weapon and armor smiths in Kanar and Roshar, and had a military discipline as strict as Alethkar's noble code of propriety. Elokar would have had difficulty fending off this foe, even if his men were rested and prepared. Yasna dismissed the steward, sending him back to his lord's palace. She knew he was withholding things from her. He claimed funds were low in his master's departure, and had given her barely ten king's marks worth of gemstones. To a common citizen, or even many lower noblemen, that amount would be a fortune but she had to save most of it on the chance of finding horses to purchase. She sighed, rising on protesting feet, then waving for Kemnar and his guards to follow her from the room. A crowd no longer lingered outside the inn. The palace stormkeeper warned that the Almighty's bellow was now imminent and had calculated that it would strike sometime during the next day. With the natural procrastination of man, the village people had realized they'd left a ten-set separate preparations to the last moment, and the town was now furiously getting ready for the storm. Glad for the respite of onlookers, Yasna passed through the common room and entered the feast hall, the large rectangular room that had been used to feed her people the night before. It no longer bore the remnants of feasting. Taln had appropriated it, much to the inn owner's chagrin, to be used as a base of operations. Here is where he had organized and catalogued the provisions they would need for their trek. Grains, dried meats, and water skins lay in careful heaps, along with the weapons they had brought with them from the palace. Tarn himself stood inside, beside his monk friend, looking over a scroll of paper written in his own hand. A young scribe stood at the side of the room, and she blushed as Yasna entered, glancing down in shamed discomfort. Yasna shook her head at the scene. Taln still seemed unaware of how unnatural his ability to read seemed to most Rosharans. Yasna waved the poor girl free, and the child scampered from the room with a bow. Taln looked up from his list. Well, he asked. Yasna shook her head. We'll have to do it without horses. Tal nodded, scribbling something at the bottom of his list with a charcoal pen. Meridas probably wouldn't take the news with such disconcern. The Lord had spoken quite fondly of being able to ride again, as opposed to walking like common footmen. I'll need to know the size of the group, then, Tal said. And the path we're going to take.
Yasna folded her arms, frowning. She had put off these decisions until she knew for certain about the horses. With mounts, a quick gallop straight north, made in the hopes of outrunning any Vaden spies or pursuit, would have been a distinct possibility. Without horses, however, their slow speed would make them relatively easy to locate. The messengers will go with speed, Yasna told herself. Our duty is to go with safety. We must survive to bring Elokar news, should the messengers fail. Very well, she said. We'll do as you recommend. Tom kept his smile to himself, though she could see the sparkle of satisfaction in his eyes. She could think of no better plan, however, than to travel north through Remak. A direct path to Kolinar would be suicide if they really were being pursued, and a diversion to the east would only place them closer to Ral Aram and its invaders. Striking west into less known and less inhabited lands made simple and strategic sense. If Tom thought, however, that she would be diverted even further, even if only for a few days, by taking him to the Holy City, he was mistaken. The group will be myself, you, Kemnar, Meridas, Kemnar's three guards, and four packmen, Yasna informed him. Tom smiled visibly this time. They would be leaving behind most of Meridas's coven of followers. The group would become a small, efficient fighting party, rather than a band of refugees. They hardly needed to worry about attacks from Remak bandits, not with three shard bearers in their company, and a small party would help them remain undetected. Brother Lan comes as well, Tom said, gesturing to the monk. Or... Would you have us go without Vorin blessings? Yasna frowned, but said, very well. She wasn't certain what function the monks served. He had taken very little part in the leadership of their group, though he did seem to enjoy spending time with servants. He professed no knowledge of fighting, and even less knowledge of geography or strategy. Yet Tom seemed to rely on him. As Tom turned to make further scribbles on his scroll, Yasna noticed something odd. There were only two windows in this room, but both were crowded with faces watching from outside. She cocked her head. The other room and her own audience chamber had been free of gawkers. Yet here, a room containing nothing more interesting than supplies, seemed a center of distinct attention. Why? Yasna's curiosity tapered as she heard a word float from a whispered conversation happening outside the near window. Harold! Madman! she snapped, drawing Tom's attention from the cluster of lanterns and oil beside which he knelt. Have you been preaching to these people? Preaching? he asked with amusement. You know, she said about who you think you are. Tom smiled. I have told them of my mission, yes, he said, and explained the coming dangers. I commanded you not to do so, she said. No, actually, you did not, he said. Or at least, not since our agreement began. Well, I intended to, Yasna said. Even when I had my powers, Lady Yasna, they did not extend to mind reading. Or at least, not the reading of human minds. Yasna felt frustration rising within. His careful practicality had lulled her, almost letting her forget about his insanity. This was no loyal servant or capable soldier, she reminded herself. This was a deranged man who could not separate fact from fantasy. His delusions seemed harmless, but only because they had yet to spark a catastrophe. Well, you shall no longer- Yasna, Tom said, quietly yet forcefully, interrupting her. If you wish to see a herald become Oathbreaker, finish that command. 
I will not forsake my sacred duties simply to honor a manipulatory bargain made with a spoiled noblewoman. Yasna felt her face brighten with rage and embarrassment that the onlooking peasants should see her so contradicted. She forced herself to at least appear calm, clenching her teeth and adapting the stonish demeanor that so often gave her strength. Tom looked back at his ledger, his face betraying a slight amount of guilt, as if he regretted the harshness of his words. You don't think they were talking anyway? He asked. The ones from the palace, the ones who saw me fight and open a passage through the depths of the mountain. I heard them speaking to the townsfolk about me and decided that it was better that I give them truth as opposed to rumors. Truth. Yasna glanced toward the windows where the people watched with still anticipation. The city was small really more of an overgrown farming community than an urban trading center. Its people's Voran training would be strongly corrupted by mystical Elinra teachings, which focused so intensely on the deific nature of the heralds and waited breathlessly for apocalyptic returns. They would be easily fooled by one as charismatic as Tom, especially considering his obvious talent with swords and his propensity for ignoring social conventions. These people don't need a herald, Tom, she said. They have enough troubles already. Their nation has been invaded by an outside force. Only a hint of the chaos to come, I fear, Tom whispered. Yasna's retort was interrupted by motion from the common room. She turned as Meridas entered resplendent in what was obviously a new sea silk outfit. Deep maroon in color, the ensemble had a pair of open-cuffed straight trousers, a white sea silk shirt, and a long open-fronted sen coat instead of a cloak. The black leather belt was wide and bejeweled. The change was hardly necessary. His blue wedding outfit had been martially cut and had worn well during their travels. Briefly, Yasna regretted dividing their provision funds between Tom and Meridas. Apparently, the merchant nobleman had a different interpretation of necessary provisions from Yasna. She had expected him to purchase extra cloaks and strong boots, not fine new outfits. Before she could object, however, Meridas waved for an overweight, well dressed man to enter. He bore bejeweled fingers, but wore no sword. Probably not a nobleman, but a very high-ranked citizen. The man eyed her, rubbing one of his chins. Yes, my lord, he said. She is slight of build, but not incredibly so. My tailors should be able to alter some things for her rather quickly. You'll be leaving the day after tomorrow? Yes, Meridas said. The merchant nodded. I'll have my girls work through the high storm. By the time you go, your betrothed will have a wardrobe to match her station. A master tailor, then, a first or second citizen who supervised a large group of underworkers. Your efforts are appreciated, master, she said. Mendalin, the man said, bowing. However, Yasna continued. We hardly have the funds right now for such things. She shot a glare at Meridas and his fine outfit. Nonsense, Meridas said. You are the betrothed of a Parshan, Yasna. If you do not look your station, no one will take you with any measure of seriousness. Besides, Master Mendalin is a longtime associate of mine. He has indicated that he'll give us a respectable discount. Assuming that once Alethkar is rid of its invaders, you will be certain to indicate to the other court women who it was that outfitted you in your time of need. Yasna raised an eyebrow. How much of a discount? Enough of one that it hardly even covers his costs, Meridas said. I got all of this for twenty ish marks. This gave her pause. It was, in fact, 
an incredible deal. Mendalin was betting heavily upon Elokar's victory and subsequent thankfulness to those who had helped his sister during her refugee trek. Yasna glanced down at her dress, the same tattered clothing she had been wearing for nearly two weeks. If this man were really willing to sacrifice pay for publicity... Very well, Master Mendalin, Yasna said. Let us see what you offer. She waved for Kemnar to fetch her a chair, stopping herself too late. It was going to take time to accustom herself to Kemnar's new station as a shard-bearer. He wasn't making it easy for her. Despite his new rank, he continued to serve her as if nothing had changed. She'd even gone so far as to officially dismiss him from her guard, choosing one of the remaining three soldiers, Vinda, as her new captain. Kemnar took it all in stride, never offering an objection, then completely ignored the fact that he was now nearly the same rank as she. Mendalin turned, waving several aides into the room. A powerful merchant such as himself didn't really have much to do with the production of his wares, but he acted as if each design were his own. He knew his stock well and produced a ten set different gown designs for her to inspect. Apologetically, he admitted that she was restricted to the colors he presented, since he wouldn't have time to create completely new garments. Yet, considering her situation, he offered an impressive number of choices. Yasna was surprised to find such lavishness in a sixth city. The gowns were constructed with a richness to match many she had seen in Ral Aram. Their delicate embroideries, Cleverly accentuated folds and rich colors were impressive. Soon she found herself debating between not one or two selections, but instead trying to narrow her purchases down to five or six. A vague shadow fell across the room as Yasna ordered one of Mandalin's models to turn so she could inspect the gown's train. Yasna glanced at the side at the change in light, to find Tarn standing just inside the supply room, his powerful frame taking up nearly the entire doorway. He inspected the frills, silken hang ribbons, and trains with a critical eye. I would have thought you'd pick something a little more practical, he said. Yasna frowned. Meridas is correct, Tarn, she said. I am an emissary of House Colin. I need to present myself in a respectable manner. We aren't going to present ourselves at all, Tom pointed out. From here, we're traveling by stealth. Yes, well, Yasna said, switching tactics. Master Mandalin's offered prices are very humble. As long as I can get finery for the price of more mundane outfits, why not choose the finery? Tom raised an eyebrow. If he will give you rich gowns for such a price, then how much less might he charge for something more sensible? Yasna flushed. Again. She could withstand the fury of kings and stare down awakeners, yet this man could make her blush in shame with barely a phrase. Meridas, unfortunately, was the one who came to her rescue. Cease your pest rings, madman, he snapped, waving Tarn away. And leave us be. This is something about which you obviously know nothing. Tarn snorted, leaning against the doorframe with folded arms, his posture indicating just how unlikely he was to leave them be. I know something about crossing stormlands, Tarn said. Our path so far has been easy. Once we leave Markabe, we will need to increase the pace drastically to avoid pursuit. I'm surprised that women can stand up in those outfits, let alone walk. Yasna sat for a moment, confused, until she realized the source of Tarn's indignation. Meridas voiced her same thoughts. You expect Lady Yasna to walk all the way to Kolinar? he said. Voice tinged with amusement. Now it was Tom's turn to pause uncertainly. We have no horses, he said. 
How else? He trailed off as he glanced through the open inn doorway toward the merchant's carts and litters outside, eyes widening slightly with surprise. He glanced at her accusingly. You expect us to carry you? Well, you wouldn't be one of the bearers, Yasna said. You are a shard bearer, but it is customary for a lady to travel by litter. That's why we're bringing the four packmen. Talon appeared as if he didn't know whether to be angered or amused. Finally, he just shook his head. I thought we were to travel inconspicuously. Litters are not uncommon, Yasna said. Along the path we'll be taking, he asked, obviously careful not to reveal too much. Yasna paused. And how fast can it be? Talon continued. Really, Yasna, are you so charmed by your own arrogant grandeur that you would risk the safety of your kingdom in exchange for a little comfort? Meridas hissed, crossing the room with a flourishing red cloak. You shall not speak so familiarly to my betrothed, madman, he informed him sternly, pointing at Talon with his left hand, right hand held to the side in a blade-summoning posture. Meridas, Yasna snapped. The mat, Talon has a point. We should think of Alethkar first. I can walk. Her sore feet and tired legs groaned at the thought. Meridas's eyes thinned as he glanced at her, and she could see something in them. Jealousy? Anger? Or perhaps just frustration? It was gone in a flash, and the nobleman contained himself. Very well, he said. Merchant, bring the lady some more simple outfits. Masculine cut, Yasna requested, with a full stride. Of course, my lord and lady, Mendalin said, waving for one of his assistants to be off. In the meantime, shall we see to outfitting my lord's attendants? Yes, Meridas said waving for Tenin and Chathan, the younger palace nobleman, to step forward. You needn't bother, Talon said with almost gleeful bluntness. They won't be coming. Meridas froze, then glanced at Yasna for confirmation. She gave it with a small nod. Instead of rising to Talon's bait, however, Meridas smiled with thin lips. And is the monk coming? he asked. Yes, Tom said. I see, Meridas said. So we leave behind two capable swordsmen who could wield a shard blade should one of us fall, and instead bring a self-professed idler with no combat experience. Behind Tom, Yasna saw Brother Lon flush at the comment. We have my guards, Meridas, Yasna said. And do we not ride to the rescue of our kingdom? Meridas asked. Your brother the king, is he not in great danger? One would think we would bring any with us who might prove useful to the king's war effort. Meridas and Tom stared at one another. Despite Meridas's words, it seemed that the two of them were not arguing about swordsmen or armies, but instead locked in some sort of personal struggle. Yasna, however, could not ignore the logic of Meridas's words. What were two more men to an army? Not much. True. But they wouldn't slow the group that much, and Alethkar's armies were going to need every swordsman they could get. In the end, however, her decision came from a different logic. She realized Meridas had been shamed. He had brought her one of his personal contacts a man willing to make great monetary sacrifices on her behalf. Then she had refused his finest wares in the name of practicality. She cared little for Meridas's honor, but as she watched the staring match between the nobleman and Tom, she realized that the pair could not see her playing favorites. She had listened to Tom's counsel regarding the litter. She needed to at least appear to give Meridas the same level of consideration. She didn't trust him. She didn't even like him. 
but she did need him. Very well, Lord Meridas, Yasna said, breaking the silence. You are correct. We cannot refuse my brother the king soldiers he may need. You may bring your men to help defend Alethkar. Meridas smiled, nodding, and Tom disappeared back to his supplies with a dark look. <laughs>